Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today for the Voices Behind Storytelling Math. My name is Hannah and I'll be guiding you through our sessions. Just to start, we have our opening speakers. I'll be listing the order. Feel free to reach out with comments throughout the whole series of the events, but I'll also be the one putting them in our chat to talk about for each panel. I'm so glad you could join us today. Well, let's get started. First up, I have executive editor Alyssa Mito Pusey. She's also the editor behind the series. Next will be Liz Simons, the chair of the board of the Heising Simons Foundation, who have kindly helped to fund the storytelling math series. Then we'll hear from Dr. Kim Brenneman, a program officer for early mathematics at the Heising Simons Foundation. And last but not least, Caldecott honoree Grace Lynn, an author of favorites like The Ugly Vegetables and Where the Mountain Meets the Moon. Okay, right now I'm going to have Alyssa take it away. Thank you, Hannah. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you could join us this afternoon. Uh, today we'll be discussing storytelling math and the mission behind it with a really wonderful group of speakers. We'll hear about diversity, representation, and early math from the perspectives of authors, teachers, librarians, and math experts. We hope you'll join the conversation too. Uh, please put your questions and comments in the chat and we will do our best to tackle them. So what is storytelling math? I have been in publishing for more than 20 years, and I can honestly say that storytelling math is one of the most important projects that I've worked on. Uh, storytelling math is a new series of board books and picture books from Charles Bridge, developed in partnership with Turk, a nonprofit dedicated to STEM education. The books bring together diversity, math, and storytelling to empower all children to see themselves as mathematical thinkers. The series, of course, wouldn't have been possible without the generous funding from Heising Simons Foundation. Uh, Heising Simons is dedicated to making advances in clean energy, science, human rights, and the education of our youngest learners. So to tell us more about Heising Simons Foundation's mission in early education is Liz Simons, the co-founder and chair of the board of Heising Simons and a former teacher. Thank you so much um, for that generous introduction. Um, I will talk a little bit about um, our early childhood education, but I was hoping to focus my remarks on how excited I am at, at this project at Storytelling Math. So let me, um, let me just begin by saying that in early childhood education, our mission is to make sure that, that children have access to what they really need um, to you know, be to progress in the world and and be the people they really want to be. And I feel like this mission fits in beautifully with that. So I know you all care deeply about young children and recognize that learning comprises all facets of their lives, their families, their racial and cultural identities, their communities. This vision is all the more salient when education opportunities hanging by a thread, especially for millions of under-resourced children of color. And the pandemic highlights the need to support children and families wherever they are in ways that validate who they are. And that's also really the DNA of our, of our program at the Heising Simons Foundation. And so I couldn't be more excited by our foundation's funding of storytelling math. Often people are surprised to learn that math is so important for young children, but research shows that the math the child knows in kindergarten is a very strong predictor of both math and reading skills later in life. People are also surprised that there are opportunities to find math in children's books but, but we see it there in classics like The Very Hungry Caterpillar, where parents and children together can count the different fruits the caterpillar eats, notice their shapes, make predictions, and observe the symmetry in the caterpillar turned butterfly's wings. Or in Leo Leone's Inch by Inch, where an inchworm wonders if it's possible to measure a bird's song. But what if instead of animals, there were more books featuring girls and boys who look like they do, Black, white, Asian, Latinx, indigenous children engaged in mathematical adventures where they are the heroes and heroines of their own discovery. Books that tell great stories grounded in families, communities. And for me, the synergy between early math and family engagement is deeply personal and takes me back to my own childhood. As the daughter of a mathematician dad and a mom who would later become a computer scientist, I grew up in a math milieu and I, I couldn't remember a time when we weren't playing math games in the car, jumping around on a number line, building castles with blocks and, and just talking about math ideas. So when I grew up and we started our foundation, I was sad to learn that math didn't always figure so prominently in early childhood settings. 
of course, children don't need their parents to actually be mathematicians to have these kinds of experiences with them. Math is all around us and families engage their children in ways that are meaningful and culturally relevant to them and that support later math achievement. For example, toddlers whose parents count out things together like beans going into a stew show stronger numerical skills in first grade. And parents who talk about shape and use more spatial terms inspire children to use those terms themselves and have a better sense of geometry when they're older. Families can talk about and do math with children in the course of everyday activities, cooking, shopping, walking in the park, and reading. And this brings me back to storytelling math, which brings together everything, literacy, family, and math. I have an image in my head of a little girl at the end of a busy day, snuggling with her mother, or maybe an older brother, turning the pages of a riveting book that transports them both to islands of ideas and imagination with protagonists who share the color of their skin. I, I couldn't be prouder to support this work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to be here and honored to share with you um, some, some words about early math, the importance of it and what it is, uh, families' roles in early math, and how this leads us to storytelling math. We're going to talk a lot more about that today. So excited. So when I say early math, I'm thinking about math that happens before children even get to school, before they go to kindergarten. So zero to five. And it's important to specify that because for a lot of people in the general public, math is something you do at school. So when you think about early math, you're just thinking about elementary school. And we know that that's not the case. We know that children come into the world ready to learn mathematics and already thinking mathematically from birth. Much as children are um, prepared to learn spoken and signed language, they're also prepared to learn the language of mathematics. And as we know, to learn to speak or to sign, you need to be immersed in a really rich environment for learning language. You need to be spoken to and have conversations and be read to and sung to in just the same way to become fluent in mathematics, like we become fluent in language, we need to be immersed in what Liz called the um, sort of math milieu. Um, and we can do that for children from birth. Why does it matter? Why do we care about early math? Well, as Liz alluded to in her remarks, early math, the foundational math that you know when you're in kindergarten or first grade, unlocks long-term school and life success. It's not just about math achievement, it's also about reading and science and getting into college, getting certain kinds of jobs. So it really, that foundational math has been linked. It's one of the strongest predictors of your success in school and in life. Um, we know though that large numbers of children in our country have been systemically kept from the kinds of learning opportunities that allow them to become and enable them to become math fluent. Um, they come to school with uh, skills that vary from those of their richer and often whiter peers. And that is the result of inequities in our society, not at all about the skills that every child brings to math learning, the talents that every child brings to math learning. And if early math matters so much, we wanna make sure that every child gets to the kindergarten door with um, the, the skills and the proficiency and the fluency that is their right. We think that families and communities play a critical role. If you think about math as happening before children even get to kindergarten, it's gonna be really important to leverage the strengths of families and communities and their expertise to address early math gaps before they even occur, before they form. We know that family math talk and certain kinds of math activities contribute to positive learning and positive math attitudes for young children. And yet, families are largely an untapped resource in, in our efforts to um, achieve math fluency for every child. Families are 
care more about young children's learning. And by families, I mean grandparents and parents and uh, older siblings, aunts, uncles, community members, fam uh, friends of the family. So it's not just parents. We know that there are so many untapped resources and it's not surprising because if you think back to what I said at the beginning, if math is something that happens in school, people aren't necessarily thinking about doing it outside of school or doing it before a child even enrolls in kindergarten. Yet, as soon as you tell families um, about the importance of early math, they are ready to go. They're like, tell me how to make this happen. They need some support. Um, so they ask for resources, they ask for strategies. And that's why storytelling math is such an important part of the suite of investments that we've made at Heising Simons in family and community math. Storytelling math builds on an existing family strength and habit around reading. Most families understand that reading to their child from birth is a really important way to help them achieve um, language fluency, but they might not know that about math. We also think that books are um, sort of an entry point into math and math conversations with children, especially for adults who might be considered math reluctant. A lot of us, unfortunately, are walking around with anxiety or even trauma about how we were taught math and how we learned it in school. Um, so we think that these storytelling math books can open up worlds for those math reluctant adults at the same time that hopefully saw, serve as some kind of a protect factor for, uh, for children being raised today so that they never see themselves as um, math anxious, that they always see themselves as someone who is a powerful and capable math learner. These books fill a tremendous hole in children's literature. The first of these is in the kind of math that children are exposed to. Most of the time, if there's a story about, about math, it's about counting or it's about maybe basic shape names. These books go far beyond that to introduce the ways that children are thinking about patterns, the way they're thinking about more complex shapes, about spatial relationships, and about who has more, something that we all know children care very much about. Um, these books also um, introduce children and provide mirrors for them, for people who look like them doing powerful math. In this way, we hope that every child, that child that Liz described cuddled up with her, with her parent or brother or grandparent, that every child sees themselves in these books and sees themselves as powerful math thinker and a powerful math problem solver. So with that, um, such a gift to be part of this work with Charles Bridge, with Turk, and I'll turn it back over to Alyssa. Or perhaps Grace, I'm sorry, I think I got that wrong. We're gonna hear from Grace next. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Grace Lynn. I'm the author and illustrator of some of the storytelling math books. The first batch, I don't know if you can see them behind here, right there. These are the, some of the first storytelling math books and I'm proud to be a part of this series. Um, there are many different reasons why I'm really proud to be a part of this series. If any of you know my work, you know that diversity is really important to me. I'll give you a little background. Um, I grew up in upstate New York as the only minority family in the area. That meant I was the only Asian girl in my whole school except for my sisters. And that gave me a really strange sense of identity. And because I felt so isolated, one of the things that I often turned to was books. And I loved books. But as much as I loved books, I also felt that strange sense of alienation because at that time, there was nobody in the books that looked like me either. So there was nobody that looked like me in school. There was nobody that looked like me in the books that I read. And I yearned so much to see somebody that looked like me in the books that I was reading. So fast forward, I became a children's book author and illustrator. And I make the books that show people like me in them. And what's important to me is to show people that look like me in everyday life. So as I'll be talking about later in our upcoming panel, uh, I had a baby about eight years ago. And 
one of the things that I found very frustrating was that I couldn't find any board books that featured babies that looked like her or looked like our family. There were the few board books I did find that kind of featured um, featured non-white children were ones called like global babies. They showed uh, babies from all over the world and they were beautiful books, but they also kind of emphasized the exotic exoticness of of these different colored babies, of these babies of different races. And that kind of bothered me a little bit because I really wanted to see people that looked like me, people who were non-white featured in an ordinary way. And that has been one of the main things that I strive for in my work. And one of the things that really, really struck a chord with me about these math books is when Alyssa and Marlene came to me and they said, we're really interested in making these math books. And I said, hmm, math, like numbers? And they both said to me, almost at the same time, said, no, 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 much more than numbers. We want to show how math is everyday and commonplace, just a part of our ordinary lives. And when they said that, it rang such a bell to me because that's how I've always felt about diversity. I've wanted to show how characters of colors are normal, quote unquote, just part of our everyday lives. We're ordinary, we're a part of it. And all of a sudden these two ambitions kind of came together and I realized how well matched they were. So one of my favorite uh, Mary Oliver poems talks about seeing the ordinary and make and realizing how extraordinary it is. And what's so wonderful about these books is that it takes the racial diversity and it makes it ordinary. It takes math and it makes it ordinary. It puts it together. And when you read the books and you see how ordinary it is, all of a sudden you also realize how extraordinary it is. You realize, wow, math and all these concepts, they're all around us all the time. And people who uh, who are not used to seeing characters of color say, oh, these people are around us all the time. Maybe they don't say it right away, but they think it. These are the seeds that are planted, seeds of racial diversity, seeds of math being something that we can all embrace. So thank you so much for coming to our math storytelling math symposium and thank you so much for looking at our books and I hope you enjoy today. Thank you so much Grace that was wonderful so why don't we go and dive a little further into the series and check out the behind the scenes. I'll have Grace and Alyssa with me again but I'm happy to introduce you to the story of storytelling math panel. Um, we're also going to have panelists like John Simeon, our design assistant, who's actually the designer behind the series, as well as Turk senior scientist, Marlene Kleiman. Let me just add everyone back to the stream, starting with Alyssa, Grace, John, and Marlene. Hi again, everyone. Now I ended on Marlene. So why don't we start with you, Marlene? Uh, would you mind talking a little bit more about the mission behind the series and how you came to us with the idea? Sure. Um, storytelling math got started when Kim and her colleague Holly at Heising Simons Foundation approached me about putting together a project involving math, picture books, and diversity. Kim and I agreed from the start that picture books are a very powerful way to help children make sense of the world around them. But it went, when it comes to picture books intended to help children make sense of math, there are some huge gaps that we needed to fill. One gap, which Liz and Kim talked about, a lot of the math picture books in print have animal and white main characters, but very few have main characters of color. Most math picture books center on counting or shapes, but there are also other math topics that are important for young children to experience. And many math picture books seem to be more about math concepts than great stories. So we wanted to create picture books with truly appealing stories to offer a different vision of what math is and who is a mathematical thinker. So I needed to find a publisher to shape this vision with me. I sought out Charles Bridge because of the quality of their books, their commitment to diversity, which has been longstanding, and their experience with math fiction. And together we came up with a vision for what math picture books can be. Alyssa? 
Okay, so um, storytelling math books are different in three major ways. They star main characters of color, and nearly all are written by own voices mm -hmm. authors, so authors writing about their own culture. They feature important but often overlooked overlooked math topics like patterns and spatial relationships, as Kim said earlier. And those topics are shown by research to be important for young children's success in all subjects, including reading. They also feature stories that kids want to read again and again. You know, we expect good picture books to be emotionally resonant and compelling. Why not expect the same of math picture books? So when Marlene came to Charlesbridge with the idea for the storytelling math books, we were all really excited. We thought it was a perfect fit. And so we, Marlene and I started talking about possible authors and the first name that came up was Grace Lynn. So Grace has been a friend of Charlesbridge since she pub published her first book, The Ugly Vegetables with us a long time ago. And today Grace is a New York Times bestselling author and National Book Award finalist. Um, and she has won the Caldecott Honor, the Newbery Honor, the Geisel Honor, and many, many other awards. She's also a tireless advocate for diversity in children's books. In 2016, Grace was recognized by the Obama administration as a champion of change for Asian American and Pacific Islander art and storytelling. So um, Grace, could you tell us about how you got involved with storytelling math? Oh, did we lose Grace? It looks like we lost Grace for a second, but while we wait for her to come back, why don't we actually move ahead and talk a little bit more about the series design with John? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> see. So are we skipping to the logo? Yes, we'll skip to the logo. We'll wait for everything to load. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be a live stream without technical difficulties, honestly? <laughs> <laughs> it keeps it authentic. There you go. <laughs> okay, so the logo. So one of the, my first jobs on working on the storytelling math project was to come up with a logo for the series. And Marlene gave us a very good, very clear prompt that it had to evoke the series it had to evoke the fun and the wonder of Grace's artwork, but at the same time, it had to avoid math cliches. Because when you think of storytelling math and creating a logo for it, the first thing that comes to mind is like, I'm going to put a bunch of division symbols, multiplication signs, and numbers. And like Marlene was like, no, we have to avoid that. We have to go the direct opposite and, you know, just create a logo that is gonna be nice and compact that can go on the picture books as well as the board books. And is gonna, it's just gonna look nice and hopefully not scare away potential readers. And so the first thing I did was just like come up and try and find out shapes and forms that would work with the series and just, you know, throw ideas out there. And this is one of like one of the mid-level stages of logo design that I came up with. Um, and it was just playing with type shapes. And eventually we I'd show this to the editors and um, our sales representatives and our marketing team to see what they think. John, we before you move there. on, I, I just want to say something about, can you oh, go sure. back for a sec? <laughs> okay, so initially I was all for the more horizontal logos. You're going to see that that didn't end up being what we stuck with because of a math issue, I wanted storytelling to come through as a single word rather than telling as separate because I didn't want to connote teaching by telling or kind of a didactic approach. I also was a little leery about story just out there by itself because I thought story problems, we don't want readers to think of that. Um, but the shape wasn't right from the design perspective. So now John's going to tell you about how hard he worked getting a vertical stacking that still had story and telling together yeah. <laughs> so that nobody would think about teaching by telling. Sorry, John, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so this is, um, eventually we went with one of the um, if you can see from the earlier slides, the two first ones, that was the type treatment that we started to go with because it was compact. It could have storytelling on two levels and then math. 
And so the way we managed to delineate between storytelling and math, because that was a big design problem is like, yeah, the benefit of the horizontal logo, as you can see in the right, is that you could see storytelling all as one word, but it was kind of it kind of limited the size of the logo itself. It had to be smaller, and because of the format of the board books, it really didn't show off, or it it really wasn't visible from like a far distance. And if compared to on the left, the final like logo idea, you could see storytelling and math. And we kind of delineated the difference between the two by just having a little bit more flourishes between storytelling and having it all in small caps and math all in, in um, capitals. Or, or no, having storytelling all in lowercase. And this was sort of like my iterations of this idea. And eventually we got like, as we were working with it, we kind of were inspired by Grace's Lynn's own little like name shop of just like how nice and compact it is and how like it's this nice, beautiful rectangular shape. And we sort of just like worked off of like Grace's own personal like branding and sort of like brought it to her series branding. So it was kind of like this nice balance between of like author voice, design voice, and math. Well said, John. Why don't we head back a little bit and chat more about Grace's inspiration? I'm going to see if I can get us back there a little faster than before. <laughs> All right, I'll let everything load. <laughs> can you hear me? I'm <laughs> okay. yeah, we can All right, good. You. Thanks for, sorry, something happened. Obviously, I was having technical difficulties, and I missed everything. So I hope I didn't miss too much. <laughs> You're all set. All right. So um, uh, that was really neat, John. I hope we hear more about your uh, more about your your process there because it's kind of fun and it's kind of really nice to to know that my own personal branding is that has like inspired this big brand. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so uh, as I alluded to earlier in the opening, um, my part in storytelling math probably began when I first had a baby about eight years ago. <laughs> and this is me and my baby. She was a really chubby one. <laughs> and, um, so about eight years ago, uh, I had a baby. And of course, being a author and illustrator, as well as a dutiful parent, I decided to fill our lives with books. Of course, I was like reading, they tell us, tell you that you should even read to your baby in the womb, right? So I was reading while I was pregnant out loud. And of course, after she arrived, I was reading with her too. Um, next slide. Do I take the slides? I'm so sorry. Am I frozen again? <laughs> Oh, Grace, um, Hannah. Is You're okay. Am I still there? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, you're still there. We can hear you. You just are frozen on screen. Okay, should I uh, should I just keep talking? Regardless? Yeah, we'll keep chatting. Okay, so that's good. Then I don't have to worry about um, the way I look. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it froze on a flattering image. <laughs> okay, um, so let's say. Uh, I'm gonna hope that it's showing a picture of me and my daughter uh, in a bookstore because one of the things that uh, I often did was go to the bookstore and look for board books to read to my daughter. And uh, one of the things that was very frustrating to me at the time, this was eight years ago, this was uh, before the We Need Diversity. Okay, sounds like we lost Grace one more time. <laughs> so why don't we move forward a little bit and talk about some of the design behind the books. Sorry, I think this will just be easier so we can keep things moving along. <laughs> Again, what's a live stream without a little extra fun, right? <laughs> Grace's design process is a secret. <laughs> That's actually why. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we can't share it. We tease with it. 
Okay, we're back to our logo design. We're now at the final logo, which I think we finished chatting about. So why don't we move forward to talk more so um, just about how that inspired the rest of the series while we wait for Grace to come back. Let's see. Okay, so putting it all together. So once we came up with a logo and once we had the art, like it was time to like start putting these books together. And one thing about Grace's artwork that I love is just like, it's like a board book, it's deceptively simple, but it's actually like, if you look at it, it's fairly complex. Like what will fit is one of the like the greatest examples of simultaneous color contrast with just these like beautiful grays and then just big giant pops of like really vibrant colors that kind of like work together in a way that like he makes the vibrant colors even more vibrant. And it was just like that, that color sense I wanted to bring to the series. And so um, one thing I, I did was like just kind of compile like a sets of colors that would be in the series or th that would go throughout the series. That, and it was just mostly pulling from Grace's artwork itself too. Just like the yellows, the pinks, the purples, all of it. And so right here, we're seeing the two final board books. And as you can see, that little logo fit in the spine very nicely. <laughs> and it's just like, it still works it just and that size as well. And then we can go to the next slide. Now, the problem was that in, a, in the board books that have their own little bubble and they work well with Grace's design and sort of like color aesthetic, but then bringing that to the larger picture, the larger brand was, I guess, the harder part because we were working with different illustrators for the picture books. And so the problem is then how do we create a single voice out of like, uh, a disparate amount of voices. How do we weave them together that they call back to the original voice that like spearheaded this like series, but at the same time not detract from their own singularity, their own individuality, their own uniqueness. And so this is an example of a picture book. It features the same typography. It features the same sort of like format. And that was it. It was kind of like the design. We could keep the illustrations uh, to a certain degree like unique and individualistic, but the design would be the overall thing that would bring everything together that would create the brand. Oh, we got Grace back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so each of the books <laughs> like feature the same design aesthetic. It kind of features the same stru design structure. And so by making things, by having all these elements that are the same, we could keep things looking, we could keep all the artwork itself different, but at the same time, when they're all together, they, they all look like they all look like they belong. That was lovely, yeah. mm -hmm. perfectly accurate. Okay, why don't we head back a little bit in time and space. <laughs> so <Yeah. we're> <laughs> there we go, Down there, okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for your patience when we get this all figured out. At the very least, we're having fun, right? <laughs> for some reason. Oh, I think you're frozen again, Grace. Yes, I think so too. Uh, why don't we just move on to uh, the next portion and I will um, talk. <laughs> okay. You can switch to voice only. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Do we want to talk more about your writing process, Grace? Okay. Um, so the, uh, I'm sorry. So we want to talk about the writing process. Is that where we are? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, so let's see. The writing process. So we were, so um, with Storytelling Map, I uh, wanted to do books that uh, I, with board books, let's start a little bit before that. Um, I really wanted to do board books that featured children of all races. And I had come to Alyssa asking, um, uh, I had you know. 
Okay, I think then what we'll do for now, just while we wait to get some of this figured out, uh, we'll move forward in time once again. <laughs> um, before we have Grace come and kind of finish talking about her process, we have seen how the logo was created. We've seen how the series itself was put together. Um, why don't we actually talk about the editorial process behind it? I'm just gonna throw us back to the slide here. All right, so for Alyssa and Marlene, what was that like collaborating with Grace too, as we have a lot of separate pieces being pulled together, not just the math and the writing, the art. Seems like it was a little complicated, but fun. Yeah, well, it, Grace is such a pro and she's so enthusiastic about everything. She really threw herself into it and it was it was so much fun. And um, okay, so, uh, so we asked, we talked with Grace and uh, about coming up with math board books and she really wanted to do these diverse board books, but she wasn't sure how to incorporate the math first. So, um, we got a, We jumped on a video call with Marlene, and Marlene, do you want to talk about what happened? Sure. I mean, as Grace said earlier, you know, she was still thinking, even though you had said to her, well, we don't want to do a number accounting book or shape book. There's lots of those out there. We want more. But we kind of had to brainstorm together, well, what are some realistic uh, genuine organic uses of math that are make sense for board books. And Grace had this idea of working through the seasons and doing a book for each season. And since we're going to see more about her Circle Sphere book, the Bubbles book, um, I think we can, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, we wanted to start with an organic reason why kids would be thinking about and wondering about shapes. Um, we didn't want to do a traditional shape book, but we thought about when do kids talk about shapes in their everyday lives. And Grace came up with the idea of blowing bubbles because there's this sort of natural, wonderful transition that it almost seems magical where you have this, this flat 2D wand that could be any shape. Um, and it turns into a sphere. No matter what you do, you blow through it and you get a sphere. So um, we thought about what wand shapes we'd want to use. And you can see in some of the edits, we, we thought through that combination of what are regular wand shapes? Well, they're sort of circular oval. Um, their heart shape is common, even though that's not a geometric shape. And we threw in a triangle because that's kind of um, a combination. A uh, heart is a combination of a, of a triangle and, a, and an oval shape. So um, on the editorial note, so Grace came up with, looks like just a few words um, that you could knock out very quickly. But with so few words, we had to work very, very hard to get just to the right amount of math in. As an example, I don't know if you can see this, but in the spread three, the second sentence originally read, my bubble is a sphere. And we changed it um, to my bubble is a ball, a sphere. So we were very intentional about subtly connecting the words sphere and ball. Not all adults know what a sphere is, nor would they necessarily find it natural to use the word when they're talking about bubbles with kids. So we spent a lot of time talking about where do we say bubble? Where do we say ball? Where do we say sphere? And what's the right balance to very, in, very gently introduce the geometric term sphere without scaring off the math avoidant? So we wanted to keep the way of talking about shapes very natural, but we didn't want to miss the opportunity to use the word sphere. So, you know, in some sense, I feel like um, we spent more time on these, you know, picking over little words on the board books than we did on some of the picture books because every word really, really counts. Melissa, do you want? To yeah, I would. Um, I would say that the the manuscripts and came in and they were just so wonderful. I mean, because like I said, Grace is a pro, and the rhythm was great. The storytelling was really tight and. And these kids just sounded so natural and, and like kids you would want to like hang out and blow bubbles with. They were just so joyful. Um, 
so we so we worked a lot on the math but the stories themselves and the characters they were already there and so we just did a little bit of um crafting just to get it a little bit tighter like in that last spread um spread seven the original text said that, that we bubbles that we can pop 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 and we ended up just taking out the first part of that sentence so the last spread is just pop 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 and that it was just it just fit the lively feel of the story and uh it was probably the one of the easiest edits i've ever had to do from the starry side um grace do you have any comments on the editing process? Oh, her, her mic is... There we go. I'm oh. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming in without video in the hopes that I can actually stay this time. Um, so uh, thank you for your patience as I come in and out of this symposium, and I hope I'm in for good now. Um, uh, I'm so happy to hear all those nice thoughts about the story. <laughs> Usually whenever I get a story, um, a manuscript back with all the like little notes, um, it always takes me like a day or two to be like, okay, look at them because it always gives you, you it always, your first reaction as an author is like, oh, what do they know? <laughs> and then you have to like look at it and they're like, oh, they actually know quite a lot. <laughs> so, um, but this, I would, I would actually kind of agree um, Whereas I didn't feel like this, the the editing was that painful for these for these books. What I really loved was how we kept paring it down further and further. Um, it reminds me of when I was in school um, and we were doing poetry, and they said, you know, every time you take out a word, it's like adding a pearl or something like that, you know. And uh, I kept I, that's how I kind of felt. Like every time we made it sparer and sparer, it made the book stronger and stronger and like shinier and shinier. So uh, that's I was really happy to have the feedback. And um, I'm not quite sure where because I came in quite a, a little bit at the end there. Um, but I have to give Marlene and um, Alyssa a lot of credit for the idea of these books. Because, you know, like I said earlier, they came to me and they said, oh, well, we're thinking about math board books. And I kept thinking, math board books? Oh, so like numbers. So I'll do like counting. And um, no, and it was really Marlene who was like, no, 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 that's not what I meant. And even though they they said that, I still didn't quite understand. She's like, no, I want to show how math is every day. And I was like, okay, so them counting numbers in everyday situations. And <laughs> she kept um, pushing and pushing how how it was more than that. Um, could somebody give me a, vis uh, a an audio cue to let me know if I'm still sharing? Because it looks like I... We can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> because um, it's completely frozen on my screen, even the the timer. So um, every once in a while, I'll ask for audio cue to make sure I'm not completely frozen and need to <laughs> log out and log back in again. Um, no, absolutely. But, Sounds good. Uh, it was. It was, as I was saying, it was really Marlene who really pushed me to say, no, no, no. Uh, I want you to think about how the things that we do in every day are math. Things and things like finding, things like looking, things like waiting, like that's math. And that really opened my eyes to what math is. And I realized, oh, that's what we need to show parents. That's what we need to show readers, that math is are the things that we do every day. And it's just kind of like putting a spotlight so that they can see that it's math. Okay, it looks like we lost her again, but why don't we um, take a look? We'll be talking a little bit more when she comes back about her models and who actually inspired the characters in her board books, because it's incredibly cute and pretty wonderful to see real kids experiencing math around them. Um, in the meantime, we'll talk a little bit more about the sketching process. So we've talked about writing. What does that look like? What does that mean to make sure we're incorporating math appropriately? How about when you actually got the sketches back for Alyssa and Marlene? How did that process work? Well, one of the things I, I can give you a math-related comment on this one. Yes, um, toward <laughs> the, the bottom, it says, 
one of the comments was show more excitement and joy. And to me, that's a very mathematical, you know, a problem. We want excitement and joy in a math book. Um, but the math component is, you know, blowing bubbles is such a natural context for observing shapes in a, in a wondrous kind of way. Um, that transition from 2D to 3D is magical. And there's that moment of what's going to happen when I blow? What's the bubble going to look like? We wanted to capture that, that joy and excitement for readers so that they can be drawn in and get just as excited as a child blowing a bubble. Um, to see what's really going to happen. So, so that was a, you know, an emotional change that we requested, but, but to me, it has a very strong math foundation. Melissa, do you? Yeah. And so when the sketches came in, so nowadays, you know, we do everything digitally. So we get, we got the sketches as a PDF and we opened it up and we were very excited. Um, and then, uh, the designer at the time, uh, Sarah, that was before John joined us on this project, um, she laid out the sketches with the text. And at that point, with as with every, with every board book, every picture book, once you see the text with the sketches, with the visuals, then something happens and there's a synergy and you're like, oh, well, we don't need that word or that word, that's shown in the art. You know, let's pare it down even more. And like Grace said, when you pare things down, and you make every word count, every word becomes more powerful. So here, it, this is a very simple example. My wand is a flat circle. And when, when we were editing, we were, you know, Marlene, as Marlene said, we were talking, we were using flat, round, trying to really make the difference between a circle and a sphere clear. But a circle is by definition two dimensional. <laughs> so we took out that word flat, we see a flat circle right there on the flat page. That word doesn't need to be there. And uh, John, did you want to talk about the design? Oh yeah. So at this point in like um, I guess the process of making the book, it's also up to the designer to like kind of go. Once we have the art and once we're seeing how it's interacting with the text, now we kind of get can see like this meta story forming. And so you can see. And I guess another thing that we need to take into account is also going back to. Um, what makes a storytelling math book and making sure that's not lost. And so there's a certain, I guess, pithiness to and to the rhythm of the story. And so we wanted to create, we wanted to keep the story, the image itself, like in this, in a similar vein, kind of fun, kind of punchy as well, but as well, kind of telling what or showing what the what the words aren't telling. I guess is what I'm going at here. Yeah, if we could go to the next one. Next slide, we could see what it looked like in the end. And so um, what it looks like in the end is like for the design and for the sketches is just like, I envision something a little bit more like, I guess, using the design in a way that's a little bit more minimalistic and something that like is a little bit more um, what's the word sympathetic with like the art, just like those nice, beautiful, bold outlines needed like a text that was not had like that same similar format. And here you can see how we gently introduce the term sphere. My bubble is a ball, a sphere. Okay. And the next couple of instances, we used ball and we use sphere again at the end, just to kind of a reminder, this is what it this, this is the math yeah. term. I'm scared. Yeah, one thing that Marlene was like amazing at it was just like making sure we never lost sight of the math, because we were at Charles Bridge. We were pretty good at like considering story, considering text, considering images. But then whenever, like, whenever Marlene needed to step in, like, just like small little math aspects that we never really considered, she would. She would say them and we'd be like, oh, oh my God, we never thought of that. Thank you. <laughs> and it made like communicating with Grace about like these things even more easier. Okay, so um, let's see, I guess uh, since Grace is in here, um, Hannah, would you mind going back to those model pages? And I'll, I'll just, I know a little bit about what Grace was <laughs> gonna say. So I'll just gonna- Yeah, absolutely. And here we are. Oh, oh, and actually, could you go back 
one more. There we go. So this is a beautiful photo of Grace in her studio. And as you can see, I mean, it's a it's a big, bright, airy space at the top of her house. And she's got, uh, you can see all of the sketches for storytelling math pinned up on the wall behind her. And that kind of gives, just gives her a sense of the flow of the story from one page to the next. It always helps to spread, spread those pages out. Um, next, please. Next one, I think. Thank you. Um, so these are two of the kids that Grace features in the book, uh, her daughter and her daughter's best friend, or one of her best friends. And uh, Grace, you know, is, um, as, a, as a person who really values diverse books and diverse characters, she also understands the importance of making those diverse characters authentic you know, real. And so as you can see, these are real kids um, blowing those bubbles and experiencing that math, everyday math. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. Oops. Oh, oh we had. Oh, here's Grace. Olivia, isn't there? Oh. Oh, um, oh I, I know where that. Okay. So, Hannah, could you skip ahead to the slides of the final art, please? And one more. Okay, so um, then once Grace sent in the sketches, we sent her revision comments and she resketched. Then she proceeded to paint. Um, next slide. Grace, are you here? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Well, um, sorry, I kind of talked about your sketch. No, no, I think that's great. You probably did a better job than I did. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about your painting process? Sure. Um, so I'm not. I'm sorry if I'm repeating things, um, but these paintings, um, all the characters in storytelling math, they are all based on real kids. So this is May right here, and you'll see in the kind of the side there's photos because May is based on my daughter. And so um, that when she was uh, this age, and uh, so you can see like some of her clothes are kind of similar. Um, can you give the next slide, please? And and her and the uh, girl Olivia is actually based on one of her really good friends. And so um, you'll see that she's were actually in the same exact clothes because uh, this is one of her her one of my daughter's really good friends and I asked her if she would pose for me she was really excited and I said you can wear your favorite fall outfit and I will I will paint you exactly like it and you can choose your name too she actually chose the name Olivia she wanted to be called Olivia and um, she, as you can see in the, in the photo she's a little bit older than she was supposed to be in the book so I had to kind of like age her down a little bit um, but it was really important for me it was really important to me that I used a model. Um, can somebody give me an audio cue to let me know if I'm still being heard? Yep, we yeah. can hear you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, because again, I'm completely frozen, but as long as you can hear me, that's great. Um, it was really important to me that I used a model, especially for o the Olivia character, uh, because uh, she, as you can see, she's a black girl. And actually this is the one of the very, very few times that I have not illustrated a character that was Asian. I almost, almost always um, illustrate Asian characters. And for me, it was really important that if I was going to uh, paint or create a character that was not Asian, not something that I was completely familiar with, that I used photo reference because that way I wouldn't accidentally um, fall back on stereotypes that may or may possibly be inaccurate. So that's why I tried really hard to use um, photo reference for her. And, I, and um, I'm really happy with how these turned out. Uh, next slide. They're beautiful. <laughs> That jacket is. Uh, <laughs> I know these kids are so fashionable and jealous of their outfits. <laughs> like, that pink color is like why what will fit was like one of my favorites and why most of the colors I chose came out of that book. <laughs> oh, okay. Right, so, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, let's summarize quickly what we are looking for when we talk about uh, activities. Now we've created these books, the process was incredible and very fulfilling, but how do we explore the math for parents? How do we make that easy for them to understand? 
Well, at the end of each book, we include an expert math note and ideas for activities to do with children. Doug Clements, who is a national leader in early childhood math education and research, wrote the math notes and activity ideas for all of our board books. And a variety of experts are providing a math note and activity ideas for each of the eight picture books. Um, we also have an additional set of activities for each book for free downloading on the Charles Bridge website. We really focused on making all of this information very friendly and accessible. We had a similar process where, you know, for the online activities, I wrote them. I tried to keep the text very minimal and think about what the illustrations would be. They went to Alyssa, they went to the artist, they went to John, and each time we cut words and we let the images do more and more of the talking because we want to be friendly and we want to we want people to do these activities, see that they're part of everyday life and um, and feel very comfortable with them. And um, you can actually see one of the activities um, this afternoon at 2.50 Eastern time. Um, we're going to be showing a video of Grace reading Circle Sphere and then doing one of the downloadable math activities with a group of kids. Um, and they really, really bring the math to life. So what that means, though, is that we made a finished series that not only helps to ease math anxiety, but makes math fun for kids. So honestly, super great for us, right? <laughs> um, thank you so much to our panelists for chatting with me today a little bit more about the behind the scenes. What I'm going to do now is just remove everyone from the stream. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then we'll get prepared for our next set of panelists. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Hannah. Of course. It's always fun to hang out. <laughs> All right. Okay. So while we're hanging out a little bit, we'll start having people filing in. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about our next panel. We'll be talking with um, Dr. Krista Aronson from Bates College and one of the founders of the Diverse Book Finder, which you might have heard a little bit about, about diversity and representation in children's literature. She'll be chatting with a few of our authors from some of our uh, books that are coming out in storytelling math in the future. So please stay tuned for a little bit longer while everyone trickles in.
All right. So why don't we get started with our next panel? This will be about diversity and representation in children's literature. Like I said, Dr. Krista Aronson from the Diverse Book Finder will be leading our panelists in a discussion about their books as well, also part of the storytelling math series. I'm going to pull my face off here so you can see our panelists and we'll start chatting. Hello, and thank you so much. I'm excited to be here today to uh, talk about this exciting set of books and this wonderful group of authors. So I'll start just with some introductions. Uh, and in, in no particular order, uh, I'd like to, or I'm excited to introduce you to author of the upcoming Usha and the Big Digger which is coming out in summer of 21. And it's one of our focus books today. Um, Dr. Knight is a graduate of MIT and Tufts University where she earned her medical degree. And in 2001, she received a letter of merit for her writing from the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And in 2012, she was named a winner of the Penn New England Susan P. Bloom Children's Book Discovery Award. We're very excited to have you here today, Umitha. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Janae uh, Brownwood is author of the upcoming Too Small Tyson, which is coming out in spring of 22. Um, Janae is also an award-winning author as well as an educator. Uh, her book, Imani's Moon, won the NASEP Children's Book of the Year Award, uh, is a Northern California ACL, ACL 2014 Distinguished Book, as well as a New York City Reads 365 Top Pick for 2016 and 2017, uh, and an RIF multi Multicultural Book Pick for 2015. Her second book, Grandma's Tiny House, A Counting Story, received a star review from Publishers Weekly and is a Bank Street Books best book of 2018. Uh, Janae completed her PhD in the School of Education at UC Davis and is also a professor at uh, Cal State University in Sacramento. Thank you so much for joining us, Janae. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Art Coulson, uh, author of the upcoming Look, Grandma, which is coming out in summer 21, is another award-winning author and an award-winning journalist. Uh, also the first executive director of the Wilma Man Killer Foundation in Oklahoma. His first children's book, The Creator's Game, told of the deep spiritual and cultural connections of American Indian people in the sport of lacrosse. Um, Art lives in Apple Valley, Minnesota, and we're very glad to have you here today, Art. And Jenny Lasica, uh, author of the upcoming Again Essie, Spring 22 is when it's coming out, uh, is a picture book writer from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, she writes about topics she identifies with, like STEAM, which is one of the topics that we'll be discussing today, disability and New Mexico culture. She's a member of SCBWI and 12 by 12, and was selected as a 2020 um, New England SCBWI Windows and Mirror Scholar recipient. So glad to have you here today, Jenny. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we're going to have a conversation about a topic that you know many of you know is near and dear to my heart, and that has to do with representation in multicultural picture books. Um, when I think about representation, I can't help but do it as a psychologist because that's my my training and background, and so. I'd like to start off just by highlighting some of the things that I, uh, some of the benefits that psychology has demonstrated for multicultural picture books, and then open it up for a conversation to kind of talk about um, some of the benefits you see, as well as some of the arcs that you've seen within multicultural picture books uh, throughout your career and in the current moment. Okay? Okay. So why representation matters? Um, well, I'm an identity researcher and representation matters because who we see depicted in the books that we read influences how we come to think about ourselves. What we see as possible for ourselves and people who look like us or come from cultural heritage heritages like our own. Um, and because also because picture books support literacy. When children see themselves represented in, in picture books, they're more engaged and the research shows that they're more likely to read and retain the information that they encounter. And we're going to talk about that a little bit within the context of STEM and STEAM books today. 
So who gets to see themselves as scientists? Who gets to see themselves as capable within this area? And who gets to picture their future selves within this context and, context and absorb important uh, academic and educational information? And also because picture books support positive social development. So they're mirrors in the wise words of Rudin Sims Bishop. They provide reflections to us about who we are and who we can become. And they're also windows for who others can see as capable, potential, uh, as scientists when they differ from backgrounds of their own. So that's the, the psychological kind of 30,000 foot view on this, but I'm really interested. I'd love to hear you guys talk about this topic um, and what it means to you, as well as maybe what you've seen uh, that either excites or concerns you within this within this area. I'd, I'd love to start if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I, I What you said just resonates so deeply with me, but I wanna add to it as well as what is the message when children are not represented, right? And so much of the statistics around the diversity in children's books is that there's a lack of it, that there's not enough. And luckily within the realm of children's books, uh, we're doing work and we're doing more to, to increase the diversity. And so that's why I'm especially excited to, to be doing this with Charles Bridge because so many of my books have been published by Charles Bridge and I can tell the commitment that Charles Bridge has to increasing the diversity. So um, it's it's just so important on so many levels for the reasons that you were saying there, but also for additional reasons uh, when thinking about some of the social interactions about how those windows and sliding glass doors allow for others to step into the experiences of people who are different than them to ultimately help build compassion and understanding and decrease prejudices. So while we're here to talk about it on the, um, you know, related to math and STEM, there's so much, so much more that, that could be cultivated by having these diverse books for children to read, so. I'll go next, okay. or Art, if oh, you wanna right. go. Okay, um, so diversity, um, I was just thinking about when I was thinking about this topic about how when we're trying to t to convince people about why diverse books are important, um, the people who weren't represented kind of already know that diverse books are important. We don't really even need all the statistics and all of the psychological reasons because we know intrinsically that we weren't represented in the children's books and that affected our lives um, growing up Indian American, I was born and raised in this country and I had basically zero books. I can't, you know, I don't think I ever saw myself in a, in a book until I was an adult. Um, and it sends you a message about kind of being a perpetual foreigner in the place where you live and the people that you know. Um, and speaking directly about picture books, um, we know that kids are so literal, especially this age of the books that we have written. Um, and when you set up your classroom with books that don't look like them, um, learning things um, that they are supposed to be learning about, it kind of starts them off with a disconnect. Um, and just kind of finally, I wanted to remind everyone about the statistics about the fact that 50% of children are non-white at this point. Um, and just thinking about the ramifications of our bookshelves and what we've seen so far, we're not really even close to parity. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. And I'll, I'll add in as well that one of the things that I've tried to do in all the books, not just this book, but in all the books that I write, if you think back on when you were in school and you learned about American Indian people, we're usually about one paragraph in a history book and usually about the Trail of Tears or maybe the Manifest Destiny, but it's always in the past tense. So what I like to do in my books is show show us in the present tense and also in the future tense, you know, thinking about American Indian people, we're still here. It's, we're not just a historical anomaly in this country. We're, we're still here, we're still thriving in these communities. You know, we, we tend to live in both worlds, you know, both our cultural 
um, homes and then also in the, in the broader dominant culture. So I just wanted to reflect that in my book so that when you know both American Indian kids and non-Native kids pick up the books, they see American Indian people just living the way that they do, doing what they do. Mm -hmm. um, I think talking about the statistics and also the 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 uh, you know current experience that Art is talking about, um, I, I'm I'm really excited about what I'm seeing in books coming out now. Um, it feels to me that the the um, assumed reader has changed, and it's now assumed that kids that we were are reading and those books are, are framed differently. And I'm seeing a lot more diversity within those diverse care, um, categories. Um, for example, when it comes to Latinos, like there's a huge range of experiences in that category. And I'm starting to see more of those varying experiences represented. And I'm really hopeful about that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add um, one more piece. Can you hear me? Yes. Fine, okay, great. Um, something that I really appreciated uh, the opportunity to do and also across my colleagues here, their books is that I appreciate that we're allowed to write diversity, but um, from a casual standpoint, one that doesn't necessarily have to be tied to race, but just a, a black child, you know, uh, an American Indian child, uh, whomever, just living, just existing. And so the stories and the content or the, the, the specific topic in that story doesn't have to be, you know, it's just about a black being black in America, but it's about a black kid just being an American in America. And so those casual stories are something that I try to write too, but I think they're they're just as important because, you know, uh, like what Amitha was saying, kind of, you know, just just this opportunity for highlighting that you're not necessarily an outsider. You're not. You're an American, you are a person here, you're living in the current situation, you just happen to have black skin or happen to have certain cultural traditions, whatever, but that you're just as important and your story is important. And it, we know with our identities, we have multiple facets within our identities. And so when, when stories are written in a casual way, like each of those get to be highlighted. And on top of that, you're just, again, you're an American living your life in this country. Yeah, I, I think that really allows characters to be seen as, as individuals, as people. And I, I really like what uh, Jenny said about starting to be able to see diversity within the diversity, um, because I know I identified a lot with um, East Asian culture growing up because that those were the books that were Asian. <laughs> And now seeing more South Asians and even South Indian um, writers uh, being published has been kind of amazing. It's just a little bit of that, like this is what people have had all along. I didn't know. Like I've been, I get so used to empathizing with, you know, the characters that aren't like me um, that it's. I almost don't even know what to do with the characters that are like me because it's so rare that that happens. It is exciting. And I think, you know, one of the things that you, you're all speaking to that if, if you permit me to kind of, you know, draw out is that presentation matters, that it's important that we increase the number of um, Black and Indigenous and people of color who are represented within picture books, as well as other identities, LGBTQ, um, gender identities. But the stories that we tell when we do that are also important. So for me, and, and I think, you know, this is what you all are saying, is it's not only increasing who is represented within multicultural picture books, it's also expanding how to allow for there to be multiple different types of representation that we can all encounter as mirrors and windows when we pick up a book so that we can see that, you know, the multitude of experience that exists for Black and Indigenous people, for instance, that we may connect with as members of those groups, or we may not. 
and expand not only our understanding of ourselves in our in our place within our within the world and what we can achieve, but then also expand our reach and our and our conceptualization of what what that social identity group is beyond maybe our own unique particular experience. So for me, it's I my passion or my hope is that we will increase the numbers of who, but also expand the how in a myriad of ways so that we can capture the rich dynamic vanity that's present within each group um, can be represented within, within a picture book. And can, can I add to, and just allow for these rich conversations to emerge with children about these things, right? And allow us to talk about similarities, but then talk about differences. And then just use this again to push this narrative forward about how important and how beautiful and how necessary diversity is just for improving our society in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So um, I'm just gonna change my speak your context a little bit. Can you all hear me? Okay. Hopefully I didn't mix things up by doing that. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, kind of building on that is this, um, you know, this idea of how children are represented in STEM right or in steam when we think about it when we think about arts and the sciences and you know part of what um we do at the diverse book finder is we we've collected and cataloged over 3,000 books that have been published since 2002 featuring black indigenous characters and people of color so bipoc characters and we have a unique tagging system that allows us to both represent and track who is being represented and how. And so I took a quick look at our data to think about how are children being, are, are BIPOC characters being represented within the, the, the STEM literature um, in particular. And one thing that stood out to me, Janae, um, relates to your comment about um, whether cultural context is present within the book or whether it's not present within a book. And when there is no, uh, when there's a BIPOC, BIPOC character in a book and there is no um, specific cultural context, we call that an any child book. And that's a, a book that makes a, a BIPOC character the star, but doesn't necessarily, it is portrayed visually, let's say with skin tone or specific cultural elements, but don't make those cultural elements um, part of the storyline. They could be removed or changed without affecting the storyline. Then there are also beautiful life stories, which are books that feature BIPOC characters and then make those cultural elements a central part of the storyline. The former, any child books within the STEM literature featuring um, multicultural characters, there are many more any child books within this category than there are books that feature specific cultural elements or books that we would call beautiful life books. So um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can um, kind of talk a little bit more about maybe the choices that you made within this space and some of, cause I'm sure you encountered this and grappled with this when you were planning your books and executing them and revising them. Um, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts about this and why, you know, maybe what direction you see your book is representing here and why you chose that particular approach. I, I can start. Um, you know, Chris, I wonder, is there sort of a hybrid of mm. the two? Um, and what I mean by that is, for example, uh, in my um, Too Small Tyson, it's about Black brotherhood and these brothers are working together. And this will be depicted in the illustrations. However, some choice of language, for example, might coincide with how African-American uh, individuals speak in America. And so while they're not necessarily highlighted, right, there's still kind of this integral piece of the story. And um, even in, I'll give another example, my book, Grandma's Tiny House, um, it's a black family, they're all coming together to celebrate, but we get some ethnic foods. But the ethnic foods 
are not the focus of the story, right? Even though they're an important piece of that. So I don't know if you would if you would classify each of those within the two, or if if they would be more of sort of a hybrid or an in between. I don't know what your thoughts are about that. But. Well, I mean, without you know classifying the books, I think it's 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 more. I introduced the language as just a way, you know, maybe to think about how you you think about your books in this area and how you interact with this space and and kind of think about the decisions. And, and Janae, it sounds like you know your thinking is for you know it to be a, a mirror and an accurate mirror where a child can say, "Hey, that's my family. That looks like you know what we do. That's us." Um, but where it is, um, where that's not, you know, um, central to the storyline. And that, that may be how you kind of think about these, these interesting elements that come into play. Um, and I'm not saying that there's a right or wrong within this context. I think it's just interesting to think about the choices that we make and, and how they, um, how they impact uh, it, why we do it, why we make those. As someone who's not, I'm not a picture book creator, I, I'm really interested in, in hearing some of your thoughts on that. All right, I see you, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that with this book in particular, um, we it's, it's centered on um, a, a young boy who is um, making, uh, uh, marbles for the game of Cherokee marbles. And when you think of marbles, you might think of those little things we used to throw in the schoolyard, but Cherokee marbles are more like, a lot of times people use like a cue ball from a, like a pool table. So it's that size. And, and some of them, people make homemade ones out of you know stone and they actually form them and decorate them. And that's what in the, in the story, he's making uh, some marbles to sell at our big national, we have a Cherokee national holiday at Labor Day every year it celebrates our uh, signing of our constitution. And so it's a big festival and there's powwows and there's all kinds of um, booths where people will sell crafts. And so anyway, my whole book centers on the experience of this family getting ready to um, make crafts for their booth and, and the little boy is um, making his contribution. Now, I suppose you could have, you know, put it in a different cultural context and the family could have been working toward, you know, something else, you know, you know, a flea market or something like that. But, you know, for me, I thought it was really important to show that so much for, for a lot of native people, so much of, of life centers on, you know, making crafts, maybe going on the powwow trail or going to a festival. And so I thought that was really kind of a, a cool way to look at STEM and everyday life for American Indian people. And I thought it would really resonate with, with, um, both American Indian readers and then non-native readers would get a little glimpse into maybe day-to-day -day life for a family. Yeah, and also the, you know, how to obtain or for the marbles, right? It's central to your book and really thinking about the volume and, and you chose right. the, the, the uh, Cherokee basket, uh, basketry uh, to, to focus on that in, in that book, yeah. which is really interesting. Yeah. And I, you know, I just, the, the way that the family is described in the, in their house and, and, you know, the way that they were scrambling around looking for something that would hold the marbles. I, <laughs> it was like my house, you know, okay, go in this room and I might have this basket here. I might have that because I'm making baskets all the time and, and, you know, they're used for various things around the house and what can I empty out and what can I use? And, and I, I thought it was very much, it very much reflected my real life. So <laughs> I was hoping it would be a little more broad too. But uh, for me, at least, it was more real life. Mm -hmm. um, so my book is called Osho and the Big Digger. And it's about um, sisters and a cousin who see different shapes in the Big Dipper and um, kind of have to learn how to see things from each other's perspectives kind of literally and figuratively. Um, and so this is more of an all children book. And like you say, it was something I really deeply thought about um, because so the inspiration for the book, I um, was actually working on a novel where I did um, a lot of research into Vedic astronomy um, and just the history of astronomy in India. And so I kind of had stars on the mind and um, so Charles Bridge did kind of an open call for math storybooks. 
Um, and they also, for people who live in the area, I live near Charles Bridge, which is in Watertown. Um, they had a, um, a workshop to kind of explain what the math was that they were looking for. And, um, and I kind of connected those two with the stars and kind of envisioned to connect the dots kind of a book. Um, and, and thinking about um, kind of um, how to fit in the research that I had done, it was very tricky because this is a book for preschoolers, you know? So this isn't a book teaching about, you know, this wasn't gonna be the place to teach about Vedic astronomy and that kind of thing. Um, and it really, I wanted to focus more on the math and on the children. Um, and I had this idea to, um, about the shapes. I was thinking like, what kind of shapes would Indian American kids think about? And, you know, really I was like, well, they're kids. They're gonna think about things in their daily life. So the main character is a girl who loves trucks. And so what does she see? She sees a truck in the stars. Um, and so, you know, I was, we did kind of go back and forth trying to find ways to, try to shoehorn in some diversity, like maybe they were drinking chai or, you know, we tried different things. Um, and in the end, it, it really did feel like we needed to focus more on the story about the stars and the kids. Um, and um, we kind of moved more of the cultural stuff to the, um, there's gonna be an author's note, um, kind of talking about more of my personal connection to that. And they did a really great job of finding an amazing illustrator um, who is also South Indian and is going to bring in just some visual details um, that I think will be very resonant for Indian American characters. I really loved her. I love her artwork and I'm excited to see how that all comes together. She's still working on it. Um, so that's kind of how that came about. Mm -hmm. Um, my book is again essay, and um, I really wanted to focus on the play. Um, I I think math is fun, and so I wanted to show that. And so the the cultural aspect is not overt. There there are some, is some Spanish vocabulary, um, but it's mostly about kids being kids, like Janae was saying, just. Um, you know, brown kids making mistakes and figuring things out and just having fun. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, it's uh, really fun the way, I mean, there's so many, the sibling relationships are, are really um, something that kids can connect with in uh, each of the, the forthcoming books. And, um, and then also the, the, the STEM components that get drawn out, like Jenny 3D um, spatial reasoning and, and understanding, um, as well as the, you know, kind of thinking about stars. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit maybe about what drew you to these elements of the, of the books that you wanted to highlight, maybe noting what, uh, what they are for each of your books. Amitha, it seems, uh, Amitha, it seems like you were kind of inspired by some of the information that Charles Bridge passed along. Um, I wonder if others had some particular inspirations there. Um, yeah, um, my book, so one of the things that they had passed along, um, something Marlene had said in um, Marlene Kleiman, who is the, um, I'm not sure what her exact title is, but she's a math expert for Turk was involved with this series. Um, she had said something about how when kids see a triangle, if it's not oriented in the way that they had expected a triangle to look, then they can't identify it as a triangle. Um, and that kind of, um, I know, ignited my imagination a little bit with the shapes and the stars. So in my book, um, the girls are looking at the Big Dipper, and I have my Big Dipper earrings. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can see that with the resolution on the camera. Um, but I had the idea of um, just how the Big Dipper looks different, depending on what rotation it's in, I and mean, how kids might interpret that um, for themselves rather than 
you know, whatever the ancient, you know, beliefs were, just like today, what would they see if they looked up at the Big Dipper? Um, and so that was kind of the math that we got into is the rotational math, which is very important to a lot of fields. Um, my background's in biology and medicine and the, definitely in organic chemistry if you, if you have trouble with identifying which things are actual rotations. Like my earrings are actually not the same because they're actually mirror image and they're not rotationally the same, you know, shape. And so that's kind of the math that inspired my book. It's fascinating. Um, so I, I tried several different stories and the, the stories just weren't, weren't hitting right. And so I went back and I thought about what my childhood drama was, and it was always my siblings. I'm an older sibling, I'm a younger sibling, so I know what it feels like to be on both sides of that. And so um, I really wanted to highlight that relationship and, and show the older sibling wanting the younger sibling out of his way and the younger sibling really wanting to be with him and learn from him. Um, and so that just evolved into Raphael, the older brother, trying to keep Essie out of his space. Being very creative in the process, absolutely. Yeah, kind of building off of what Jenny was saying, um, the sibling relationship was a uh, is an integral part of my book as well, um, and proportional thinking. And so, Jenny, in my case, Tyson is the youngest. And he's the little brother and he's got all these older brothers that tower over him. And so here he's constantly wanting to show like, I can help, I can do things to be like, no, no, it's cool though, man, we got it. Um, so the proportional piece felt like it fit in different ways. Uh, the proportions just as far as like what his older brothers can do with more ease that is more difficult for him. So even just taking uh, steps to do some kind of movement for the older brothers, it takes fewer steps because they've got bigger feet, right? Versus it takes way more for Tyson. So some of those proportions. Um, so I had some initial ideas, um, but Marlene especially helped uh, uh, cultivate those even more and helped me to, in a clearer way, really show how these proportions could work within um, that uh, Tyson's family's home. So I really, I really think that you know the the work that Turk was doing and Marlene is especially was helpful for me to to like pinpoint. Oh, this is the piece that we're gonna you know focus on a little bit more, and then allow for my ability to write narratives to 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 really help that that come through clearly. Well, I'll add as well is um, as Jenny saw. My book changed a lot during the writing, um, and my my book really look, focuses on volume and space, and you know what can hold a certain amount. And one of the things that we got tangled up with, and Marlene was a big help with this, was when I was talking about when we first started. We we started instead of Cherokee marbles, we were using Cherokee lacrosse balls. And in Marlene's mind, because she didn't know the sport of you know, of course, Cherokee stickball. Um, our lacrosse balls are a lot smaller than modern lacrosse balls. A modern lacrosse ball is more like a pool ball size or the Cherokee marble size. But um, our traditional Cherokee uh, lacrosse balls are the size of a walnut. They're these woven leather or, or um, stitched leather over a nut or a rock or something. And, and that's what we use. And so when I was initially doing the book, you know, really struggling with, you know, how many would fit into this or whatever. And <laughs> we ended up switching to Cherokee Marbles because that worked better with the book. So like Jenny, it, the book went through several iterations before we got, we arrived at what was really kind of appropriate both culturally and for the math. And, you know, not being a mathematician myself, I was really thankful to have the editorial guidance that I had because I wanted to get it right, you know, for the kids. Mm. I wonder, I wonder if y'all might find this opportunity a nice chance to, to um, talk with one another about some of these questions um, and uh, maybe um, challenges that you faced or, or just to, I don't know how often 
um, you get a chance to talk to others kind of creating in the space. So I'll just make room for that to, to happen. Uh, so I had a question that uh, I kind of jotted down for you guys. Um, so my question is, I'm gonna try to word this well. Um, so think back to when you were a kid um, and I was just wondering how might little you respond or have responded if someone gave them your book? I don't know if that makes sense. Like how might you know little Jenny have responded if someone gave them the Essie book? And uh, how might that have made you feel and how might that have affected you? Um, I mean, so I have the benefit of having some kids who are right in the age range of these books. And, you know, it's my hope that kids get excited about the scenarios and want to replicate them. Um, I tried to be very intentional about creating my story around object because it was rotational geometry and manipulating items. I wanted it to be items that aren't specific items that you have to go out and buy. Um, I wanted it to be a kid going around their house and just collecting things, just anything they have lying around because I really want kids to see that and see that they can do that too. They can collect things and stack them and move them around and, um, you know, be inspired to create and have fun with math. Well, I'll, I'll uh, answer a question too for Janae. I, you know, I think back when I was a kid, there weren't a whole lot of books about American Indians, like contemporary American Indians. You had a lot of the, you know, the guys out on the open prairie kind of riding their horses, but didn't have, and, and the ones that we had weren't really, they weren't written by American Indian people. So they had kind of that veneer of, you know, kind of, yeah, this is kind of about us, but they don't really get it. Um, I think of one I used to read, um, <laughs> Joe Panther, it's about this kid, a Seminole kid who lived in the Everglades and, his family used him as bait to catch gators and all this stuff. I was like, wow, man, those Indians are kind of rough down there. Um, so I didn't really have anything to really compare, you know, myself to. I didn't see myself in anything. And so I would have, if I'd have gotten this book, nobody would have had to tell me, hey, this is about you or this is about your family or your life. I would have just known. I would have said, oh, wow, hey, look, they got baskets like we have. You know, they got, they got a lot of the same stuff in their house that we have that you don't see reflected in picture books. They're just kind of flying around on tables. And so I would have been, I would have been very excited. Nobody would have had to point it out to me. I would have just known, I would have said, I would have felt like, wow, this is a book that, you know, that gets me and that, that I get. Yeah, I love that, what Art said. Um, you know, if, if I had been able to see a book about, um, you know, an Indian kid who was in this country and it's a book that was in a bookstore in America and not something my parents had to bring back in a suitcase from India. Um, that would have been huge. And, you know, it's and my book's about sisters and obviously it's inspired by me having a sister. <laughs> I have an identical twin sister actually. Um, so that, I think that would have been a, a lot of fun and I would have enjoyed it. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, I guess to answer my own question, I just think that I just wonder what how it would have influenced me too. Because um, one, I am not a lover of math. I'm just gonna put it right on out there. I like words. I think is why I ended up being a professor and uh, an author. But you know, just sometimes I wonder um, if I had seen books that looked like me or my family members that were centered on math. Perhaps this would have helped me to start build to start building positive associations with math at a very young age, right? Um, especially in my book, it's young black boys and math. And I, I just feel like so often as, um, in the context of sort of black Americans, there are a lot of stereotypes and there are a lot of sort of negative narratives that are shared and very often like perpetuated in media, for example. Um, but then to have this one that contradicts those or goes against those and shows 
hey, not only is this lifting up you and brotherhood and your family, but it's got math in it too. And it's got math being done again in this casual way to problem solve for something that anyone could experience like um, losing a pet and trying to figure out how to, you know, to recover that pet. So I, I just want to say that my um, my kids have gerbils and that same thing happened <laughs> multiple <laughs> times. I, I love to, it. I was sure our cats had eaten them and they were behind the washer and dryer. <laughs> so today's book is about finding gerbils and <laughs> yeah. yeah, I totally related to that. <laughs> I promise I wasn't like looking into your window and like, oh, that's happening. I promise I didn't do that. <laughs> but um, thank you for sharing that. But Amitha, I'm so glad that you said that because I think that goes along with, again, some of the reasons of why I do what I do, that casual piece, but then to also help children across the board say, oh my gosh, that happens in my class or in my house. Oh my gosh, that happens in my house. And again, starting to, to cultivate those relations relationships and those conversations about what we do at home is similar to what you do at home, even though we might look differently. Um, right. And also just relating that it is a math book, even though it's a story about gerbils and thinking about how math isn't just what's two plus two, what's, you yes. know, yes. arithmetic. And it's, it's about a lot more than that. And it's everywhere. And it can be fun. I think so often you think of math as being a chore, depending on your experiences with it, but that it can be fun and engaging and push your, it isn't challenging to help you problem solve and across the board, right? Wherever you are, there's math. So, um, so I think if I had got this book again as a young child, I, it might've made me look at math a little bit differently and it might've cultivated some excitement about math in me. Well, I, I like what you said, Janae and, and Amitha, too, about the, the everydayness of math. And because when I was growing up, you know, I never thought I was, I was, I was okay at math. I did, I excelled in school. But I think of that now as that's book math. And you don't think about, I mean, that the formulas you're taught and the, and the rules and that sort of thing. And, th and those are important foundations. But there's an educator here in the Twin Cities named Jim Rock, who does a lot of presentations to school groups around, um, indigenous concepts of math and science, like star math and like the Inca counting system and things like that, that kind of show kids that there are other ways of looking at math, maybe some cultural ways. And so as I was approaching the book, I, I wanted to get away from the book math part of it, which, you know, kids will get enough of that in school. But really, you know, as you guys were saying, the everyday part of math, and math is, is all around us, you know, math and science are all around us. And, we all know. And so this may be, I, I, my idea was maybe this would help kids stop thinking themselves as not good at math or, you know, I don't understand math because you are good at math. Every day you interact with your natural environment, you're doing math and you may not even realize it. So I was wondering if that was kind of going through your minds as well as you were uh, approaching it. It sounds like from the discussion already that that was kind of maybe part of the, of the way you looked at the books, but just like to get your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely was thinking about that. Um, so I math was big for me, actually. I really love math and I have some props here. My um, state math counts competition, second place. <laughs> so I was a mathlete growing up. Um, <laughs> so I, I was really excited for this because like, oh, finally, something about diversity and about math. And this is this is up my alley. And actually, I had pitched um, several story ideas um, to Charles Bridge in person, um, and they did not pick my ideas. <laughs> and I went home and like um, they had invited um, everyone to email them more ideas. <laughs> so I, I was like, OK, math is in my blood. My mom was a math teacher. Um, and, you know, I'm a diverse author. <laughs> I've been writing for a while. I have to figure out something that's going to work for this. Um, so, yeah, that's <laughs> kind of how that came about. Yeah, I really like, I love what you guys are saying in art. I, I like what you were saying, too, about like the everyday math versus the book math. And then kind of aligning that with what Jenny was saying, the importance of play right? The playfulness that really is inherent in math. And that sometimes it feels like that kind of goes by the wayside when the book math comes in. And um, what's especially exciting for me with what 
Charles Bridge and Turk are doing is not only are they providing math, right, and fun things that can be done, it's including diversity and it's including literacy as well. And almost, again, in this way to model how you can find the playfulness of math for educators and for parents so that they can be seeing that themselves when they're doing this with their kids. And then, I don't know, like almost changing the way that they look at math to look for some ways to be playful with it, to continue to sort of model that for the kids around them. Um, I, like Amitha, really love math. Um, I'm also an MIT grad, so um, I thought back to, you know, how my parents encouraged that love, and it was always, like, games and puzzles and the way things fit together, and I have, like, a little thing my mom made. It's just, like, little pieces that you put together into a square, and it's just, like, manipulating things and how they always made it fun for us. And so I thought that I really wanted to bring that feeling in, you know, how my parents encouraged math, the love of math in me. I'm wondering um, if, if any of you, um, when you were writing your stories, did you, were you mindful of like how your characters would be perceived in like the bigger picture? Did you did you have anything holding you back? And like, you know, when when you're talking about diverse representation and there there aren't that many books out there, do you worry that you were representing this large swath of people, or were you more interested in representing just your character and how did you deal with that? That's a, that's a fabulous question. And I think we have uh, a, a one or two uh, opportunities for a response given the, the time. This has been so wonderful to hear you all. So I think in the first couple of drafts, I really had that in mind. And my first few drafts were very precious and very, you know, big pictures about the stars and girls. Um, but as we kept moving, I really focused it more on myself and what I was like as a kid um, and what I would have wanted to read as a kid. So I'll let others <laughs> answer. I, I don't know. That's such an interesting question. I kind of feel like I was doing both at the same time, not necessarily focusing, but I was being mindful of maybe some stereotypes. And I do remember um, having, I guess I could say conversations with myself or being reflective about some of the choices that I made. Like for example, basketball and black males could absolutely be considered a stereotype, right? However, I thought for my story, and if I was thinking about like my male cousins and some of the experiences I've had with them, playing basketball with each other in the driveway is absolutely something we would do. So while maybe some might consider it to be a stereotype, no, this is, at least in my own experiences, this was authentic. So I wanted my boys, my, you know, Tyson and his brothers to be engaged with that, even though it could perhaps be considered stereotypical. I don't know if that makes sense, but I did that purposefully because I felt that there was value in showing these boys doing something that I know many African-American boys engage in and something myself I liked to do, playing basketball in the driveway. So I don't know if that illustrates what I mean, kind of doing both at the same time um, and, and trying to do it again in an authentic way. Yeah, that, that tension, right? You think you've articulated that tension between wanting to represent authentically the day-to-day -day lives of the characters in your book and also doing so in a way that doesn't make it seem as though that's the only aspect of the day-to-day -day lives. And so really enriching in the way that all of your stories do to portray that that tension within within a picture book, which I think is, is, is remarkable and wonderful and one of the things I cherish about the picture book um, in that way that it can do both in that textual visual interplay um, and, and in so many other ways. So um, I, 
correct me if I'm wrong, Hannah, but I think that we are at the end of our time today. Uh, so we are. Thank you so much uh, to Krista and to our panelists. That was an incredible discussion. I was absolutely cracking up at points in the back end. I'm sure that was distracting, but <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're actually going to head into a 15 minute break as I move people off stream. Uh, don't be alarmed. We'll be watching a short video, um, just focusing a little more on the behind the scenes of storytelling math. So I'm going to share my screen now. And I'll see you guys back here at 305.
All right, so why don't we get started in our next panel. We'll be talking about representation in early math for schools and libraries with Marlene Kleiman, who'll be leading. Again, this is the Turk senior scientist who brought the storytelling math series to us as a concept and then let it flourish. So I'm gonna pass it over to our panelists um, and I'll be out of your hair. <laughs> Marlene, why don't you take it away? Hi, is everybody, everybody's here, hi. Um, so I'm here with Julie Roach of Cambridge Public Library and Vera Ahia of the Tutu Teacher. And I'd like to start with everyone saying a little bit about how each of us got involved in children's literature. Vera, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I have been teaching for 15 years, and so children's literature has always been a part of my life. Um, I'm also the daughter of an English teacher, so reading was, uh, I don't want to say mandatory because it's fun, but it was mandatory. Um, so I've just always loved children's books. Um, and then it's been fascinating and exciting to see how over the course of my educational career that more of my students get to feel like their stories and or their faces or their families are now in the books that we read. Um, I've been, um... I've worked in youth services at public libraries for 15 years also, Vera. Um, and um, I sort of stumbled my way into that, but but my mom was a first grade teacher. And so um, art and story and that connection between the two was always something really important in my house growing up. And, um, and it just always was. And I finally sort of stumbled into my calling and librarianship and I get to do that for a living. So <laughs> connecting kids to art and story and information. Well, my background's in math um, and children's development of mathematical thinking. Um, I started out as a math curriculum developer, but for most of my career, I've worked on math outside of school, collaborating on math with librarians, child care providers, and families. And a lot of the different collaborations I've been involved in have used math picture books in some ways. But over the years, my partners and I have found very few math picture books with main characters of color and really good stories that kids want to hear again and again. So a few years ago, um, I was thrilled when Kim and Holly at Heising Simons Foundation asked me to put together a project that involved diversity, math, and great stories. So. All of us on this panel do some work with adults, parents, teachers, librarians, and others. Um, what do you see as the biggest math-related challenges and opportunities with these audiences? Julie, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think um, I think one of the challenges uh, when thinking about incorporating math into um, into what we do with young children is uh, that there's there's a cycle, right? That um, many of us didn't have those great connections to math when we were little, and so sort of knowing how to do it and knowing what is important um, can be can be a challenge. It can be hard to think about how to integrate integrate that into um, into sort of everyday story time or everyday conversations. Uh, how do you do it seamlessly and make it you know, put it into the context of um, all the world around you. Uh, but I also think that's one of the opportunities, right? We have a real chance to break that cycle. Um, we really uh, know so much about how to, um, about what math is and how it affects kids from, from birth and how important it is because um, it really is sort of how we organize and put the world together around us. So I think it's a little bit of both. <laughs> Very, oh, your um, mic is muted. Sorry. Um, I also think that with parents and and specifically like with young children as a kindergarten teacher, it is about telling parents to just give kids experiences. Like when you go to the grocery store, you know, count how many cans you're putting in your card or what shapes do they see as you're walking through your neighborhood, just really making them feel like math is all around them and really reiterating that it is everywhere. It's in everywhere. You see, you don't have to um, download worksheets or it's not a workbook. It's actually having conversations about math. And as we see numbers and talking about how you see numbers and 
why do you see two and one when you see three? Um, just those things. But if we don't talk about it, no one understands how to start the conversations. I think another big opportunity, I love the idea of talking because I think it's it gets it um, for those people who were here for the last panel. Um, there was some of the authors were talking about the difference between book math and everyday math as they saw it. And that's a question I get a lot is how does this help my kids in school? Um, and we know that many kids struggle with math in school because they're asked to manipulate symbols and equations at seemingly earlier ages and um, that they have very little meaning for. So, you know, like memorizing formulas for converting from pounds to ounces when they don't have a sense of what those measurements mean. So talking, as you say, is so important to show kids those connections. I think it's working with adults is another opportunity to broaden views of math. Um, Kim and Liz talked about this early on that adults recognize that kids need to know about counting and shapes, but there's a lot of research that shows that kids benefit from exposure to a much wider range of ma math. Like, um, as Kim noted, some researchers say that patterns and spatial relationships are among the most important topics for the early years. And children who are comfortable with that kind of math actually do better in all school subjects, even reading for years to come. So, you know, another opportunity we have when we work with children and adults involves broadening views of who is a mathematical thinker. How do you think picture books can help children see themselves as mathematical thinkers? And why is racial diversity so important in math of all subjects? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, when I think of math, I don't think of uh, people necessarily. I don't think of mathematicians, um, even though my grandfather was a math teacher, my husband's a math teacher, and those are both people of color. And so how can we start to shift that thinking where kids can start to put a concrete, because math is all about the taking the concrete to the, or taking the abstract to concrete. So how can we help kids have a concrete understanding of themselves as mathematicians. Um, and I think picture books are a great way to start, again, that conversation is, wow, do you see, you know, like um, this circle and sphere, we're learning about shapes in kindergarten right now. And so when I read these books to my students and have them talking about like, oh, have you ever done that? What happens when you blow a bubble? And really grounding their experience with math, not only in their own, relationships and experiences, but also what they see reflected back. So then it confirms for them like, oh, I have also, or I could also, or I do that also, um, instead of saying, well, like, oh, you know, we keep seeing the lack of ourselves in books. And then how do we understand that we can also be a part of that world, whether it be fantasy, you know, fiction, it also applies to the nonfiction as well. And so I'm really excited about the Storytelling Math series um, one, because there's the way that things have been thought out as in terms of the broadness of math. You know, it's not just geometry. Um, you have weight and you have length and different measurement. There's so many things to talk about, but then there's also so much to learn, so many cultures to be exposed to, so many languages. Um, and there's only, I like, I think I only have like six books out and there's already so much to dive into. Um, so yeah, it's exciting, but I think it's a necessity. And when I work with um, teachers, a lot of times math science uh, educators will just say like, they kind of get a cop out of like, well, I don't have to worry about diversity, you know, because I only teach math and it's offensive, but it's also untrue, you know? Um, and when you think of the history of civilization and the world, you know, that did start with black or with people of color, you know? And so let's get that conversation um, into your math time and into your, well, science is math too. So like, when are we talking about who is doing math, who is doing science? And let's show our kids that they can do it too. Definitely. I think I think that's something that I noticed sometimes too with kids um, in math and everything else, that if, if a child doesn't, feel like they're a part of that conversation in a real way, 
they also kind of um, react against it, right? Well, fine, I don't want to be a part of that conversation, right? And that's that's detrimental to um, our society if, if our kids sort of think, I don't want to be a part of math. I don't want to learn to speak that language or, or um, you know, become fluent in that. And one thing that these books do really well is that they, um, not only do they invite everyone into the conversation, but they show you you're already a part of math. This is happening in your family with your friends at home. Like it's it's already there. Um, so it makes them feel not only invited, but like they they've been there all along, which is um, something that um, maybe isn't hasn't been so prevalent in some of the previous children's books that we've seen. So it's it's a welcome change uh, for kids to be able to find that um, in their stories. You want to, you know, emphasize something that we heard in the representation panel, but also, I you know, Liz uh, Simons opened opened the program with this, is that the majority of math picture books in print have animal or white main characters, and those books do not give readers an image of kids of color as mathematical thinkers. You know, so I've heard from some educators, well, we look for the animal books so we can avoid race. Well, what that does, <laughs> besides as you say, very being very offensive, it it also it perpetuates the status quo, which is that there are not a lot of kids of color featuring as main characters, and and I think it's really important for white kids too. Um, or yeah, that's another thing I hear sometimes is, well, my community is mostly white, so we don't need these books, and I think it's very very important for those people to have books that feature fully realized, really emotionally resonant stories that show kids of color engaging in mathematical thinking because those images stick with us and they can influence our expectations and biases, whether it's on a conscious or an unconscious level. As implicit assumptions about kids' math abilities learn race begin in preschool or even earlier, according to research. And a lot of people, you know, seemingly are very well-meaning, but they have clear subconscious ideas about who is a mathematical thinker and who isn't. And picture books can really, you know, give us a different vision that that impacts how we think about math and who, who does it. There was a study um, done in the UK, not very recently, but more recently about, um, you know, stories that feature animals. Uh, versus stories that feature people. And it was in relation to emotion and le learning uh, the moral of a story, but it found that children, when they heard stories about an animal versus when they heard stories that featured a person, it could be the same moral, like the moral of you know being kind to others. Um, children were able to replicate and understand the story um, better when it was a person, right? Because kids are egocentric. So especially young children, so they can put themselves in that scenario. They can put themselves in that situation. They can act it out. They can see it happening for themselves. Whereas with animals, it's kind of like fairy tale, not really real. Um, and so it's really important, again, to continue to find the books that show the world um, to our kids, but doing the things that we know everyone has to do. Everyone has to do math. Everyone has to learn about shapes. So why can't that be a black character doing it? Why can't it be, um, you know, a, an Asian child doing it? Why are all these things only reserved for certain kinds of people? Right, for animals who, who now we have picture, we have our, our mental images of animals doing mathematical thinking, but we need <laughs> to move on from that. So another thing that we've, we've kind of touched on is the role of fiction. Often when we talk about early math books for children, we think about counting and concept books, but what about fiction books that portray emotions and experiences? How can they be a powerful way for kids to explore math? I um, I, I think often when um, children and families think about books that have math in them, they think about textbooks or word problems or um, these very sort of academic um pieces and um, the beauty of incorporating math into a story is that you really do sort of take it out of math class and put it into 
into your backyard or into your kitchen or into your living room. You know, you sort of really bring it home in a way. Um, the power of story is is um, is so important, and um, and you, it's such a way of connecting um, a child to the world around them in a in a way that perhaps a um, um, a a nonfiction piece might might um, some narrative nonfiction does a really good job, but uh, you know, it, it's it's story is something that can really capture our imagination and sort of bringing math into that in a way um, just sort of makes it more of the everyday, which I think is really important. Um, and it's a great way to use it um, in story time or in you know getting math into your other subjects, making it more universal. Yeah, I think the great thing about math, I think for me, especially in the younger grades, because the older math, um, older grade math is not my strong suit, but still, um, is the ability for kids when they see uh, these new concepts or learn these new concepts to be able to act them out and play around and make a story around them um, so that it becomes concrete. You know, that's why we're big about manipulatives, right? So if we're saying, I have three cubes and I take one away. We want to put those cubes in front of the kid as we're talking about it. But what if we made a story with it, right? I think there's been studies that link, um, you know, girls being able to retain information better as it relates to science and math when it was told as a story. And so being able to say like, okay, well, I have you know, three houses and then, I don't, this doesn't work for this, but like one house moved away, how many houses are left, whatever. But having them be able to tell a story around their thinking and processing um, helps them be able to hold on to that information a little bit longer and process it better. And then putting it into different scenarios, you know, we do math here, we do math here and not as it exists in a block of a subject area of a time of your day that it's it's throughout, it's interwoven, and we really have to be aware of that by telling these stories or acting them out or playing with math um, and not just regulating it to, you know, 1.30 to 2 o'clock every day. I yeah, love the acting out. I think this was something Jenny mentioned on the previous panel about, um, thinking of her book as a way to spark something kids would do. And this was, her book is about building with boxes around the house, but it's, um, it's something that you can read about in the book. You can identify with what the kids are doing because you've probably already done it. And then you can go and do more of it, but the spotlight's been shown on where the math is. So you may be, approaching it after reading the book with some new ideas. Yeah, I think about the, there's so many great stories, but this one, the who has more, and I'm thinking about even, I don't have children of my own, but in the class when it's snack time, or when it's, you know, we're doing an activity and that instant anger of who has more, um, that, you know, I could see it with siblings. I just, you just know that that's a thing. That's a like, and so then being able to play around with, well, what does more mean? And like, how can we put the learning into these arguments or these unfair moments or these lack of justice, you know, opportunities and really kind of find the math there. Um, and I think the story does a great job of helping kids understand the opportunities for um, who has more and understanding. Right, and the way you decide who has more is going to depend on what you're comparing and why. And I think I think one of the things emotions do. I mean, who has more is it's well, I guess like a lot of our stories, or maybe all of them. There, there's you know, there's a real strong emotional component. Um, but if the kids connect with the emotions of the characters, then they can be thinking, even if it's not consciously, that could be me doing that mathematical thinking. And they feel that kind of visceral, I've been there before. I understand what that's like. Um, you know, it also sends the message that we're all mathematical thinkers. We've all had conflicts with 
with other kids, you know, when we were children with who has more. And I think um, the same way with um, realistic fiction that's about something familiar, it really helps kids connect with um, the math around them. For when Alyssa and I were reviewing, we had almost 500 manuscript submissions for the picture books. And we would always be asking ourselves when we read them, is this genuinely how a child would be using and talking about math outside of school? I mean, we know how they do it in school with, you know, nice pattern blocks and certain shapes, but but in everyday life, does this feel familiar? Is this what kids would really do? Because we wanted stories that, you know, took a little snapshot of organic uses of math so that kids could could connect with it. Um, it's the... The funny thing about math is that that we teach we teach we have math class in school so that you can learn how to use math in the real world. And I think where we get stuck mm -hmm. is that <laughs> everyone thinks they don't need math class in school because they don't see how it relates in the real world. So I think it's really important to start there. We um, already use it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? So, so some people say we're, um, that math is a universal language. And if that's really the case, what's your argument for why we need own voices math stories? Yeah, so like I mentioned, my husband is a mathematician. So math is, as a universal language has been kind of his soapbox since we met. Um, and so as I've come to understand what that means and as my own journey with, you know, celebrating diverse literature um, kind of intertwined, it, it definitely is one of those things, again, where we can't, we have to stop putting things in boxes and sectionalizing like, okay, you can do this when we can have this opportunity here, but all the other places, it doesn't really matter. It's not as important. It doesn't happen. And so when we start to uh weave in these opportunities throughout everything we do not only does it make things easier for their chil for children to understand and they get the concepts but then they understand themselves and the identity of who they are as a learner becomes solidified um and so having books that show themselves doing math solidifies the fact that math is everywhere there are mathematicians you can grow to you know be whatever you want to be but if it is increasing your understanding of math, that's just a bonus. Um, and I think that we just really have to get used to putting things or used to not putting things in boxes and continuing to let opportunities uh, for children to be confirmed in their identity happening all throughout their time, you know, in school and out, but just a lot, a lot as much as we can, just giving them so many experiences, so many reasons to be like, oh yes, me too. Or, oh yeah, that looks, oh yeah, I've done that. Or I've seen that, or that's my family, or that's my language over and over and over again. Math, science, reading, everywhere we go, a child should be able to say like, me too, that's me, I can do that. Yeah, math, math, math is a universal language in that math works the same way all over the, the world. And everyone has to learn how to do math <laughs> in order to be able to be a part of that language. And if you if you don't feel it's for you or you don't feel it's for your neighbor, that's a problem. Um, so having that sort of visual reflection of here we are all doing it and it's fun and it's a part of everything that we do every day, then then we all sort of learn to speak that language. It's a language that's available to us, but if we don't um, if we don't engage with it and interact with it, and if no one um, makes us feel like it's you know that it's for us, then then that's that's then then suddenly some of us aren't invited to the universal language and that's a big problem. Um, that can really wreck society, I think. Um, so um, that's why it's so important in my opinion. Well, and even if there are aspects of math that are universal, which, you know, maybe there are, maybe there aren't, but but stories are not abstract math. They're grounded in 
contexts and cultures. And I don't know, I feel like our storytelling math, picture books, culture, diversity is so woven in. Um, they had to be written by own voices authors. You know, I just, I, Janae was talking about the, you know, some of the nuances, even though her story um, about finding a lost durable, this was in the previous um, panel, you know, it's not, it's not a, a cultural story per se, but she's woven in so many aspects of um, her African American experience. It's, it's a very different kind of story, I think, than um, a white author would have written with, you know, an illustrator who painted the, the characters' faces. And I think apart from the math, just as we want kids to see themselves on the pages of the book, they should see authors that look like they do. They should be able to look at these books and say, I like writing. I like stories. Maybe I can do this. I just would agree that authenticity is so important to any story, sort of, that you you can't fake it, you know, <laughs> it really um, uh, sort of knowing what you're talking about is uh, in that visceral way is um, is critical to, to telling a true story. Yeah, I think too is even if you could fake it, why do you need to, you know, so it's but it's both of those things is like um, the authenticity, but also the the opportunities. And so you know, it's not you know the what does it say like um, something is not it's not pie. I can't think of the quote, but basically like everyone should be able to have equal opportunities to be able to do um, and tell their stories. And um, you know, it's very it's one thing that Charles Bridge worked to have you know, math stories that featured kids who were um, of diverse cultures and language, but also the authors that told them stories. And I think the combination of both of those from an educator educator standpoint is more impactful. It For me, it feels like there is, is more push to, to incorporate these into everyone's classrooms um, because of the fact that Oh, this is a, this is an own voices story, and so again, like you said, maybe this inspires a kid to say, like, "Oh, me too." Then, me too. Then, yeah. And our illustrators are also own voices, which again is the kid who who draws. <laughs> Let them look at that and say, "I could be do. I could be illustrating books." So, so I wonder in the last few minutes, um, to borrow from what I saw in the last panel, um, do you have questions for each other? And, and then says, I have a question for Hannah in the background. There are, um, I see some questions in the chat about, um, it's really more for a publisher than for anybody here. And I don't know if we want to bring someone, you know, Alyssa back on or uh, someone to answer those. But meanwhile, um, do you have, Julie and Vera, do you have questions for each other or for me about how you each use math, math in your work with kids? Um, fun, <laughs> Vera. <laughs> um, uh, tell us, um, are there experiences that you've had with your kindergartners that, um, that surprised you about how they interact with math? Um, I feel like the, the, Biggest surprise I get from kids is when, you know, we're starting to do our like formal or informal early assessments and 
developmentally, you know, there is a place where most kids generally are in their math concept knowledge. Um, and then you have, you know, that one kid who's just like, oh, well, this is a quadrilateral and da, 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 da. And they just kind of like reel off all of these things they know about either shapes or number sense. And, um, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, is somebody at home? either a teacher or a mathematician, you know, that pushes these conversations. But a lot of times it is sparked by kids' general curiosity. The families have taken them down the path of understanding. So I'll talk with families and they'll say, or caregivers, and they'll say, um, you know, they were just really interested in numbers. So then we just started counting every day, or they were really interested in how shapes were formed. So we learned about all the different ways you you know, you can make a shape with four lines or so I feel like at some point, though, that gets lost, that that curiosity spark, both for kids, but for kids to question their understanding and then families to start to families or caregivers to start to push them. And they kind of just become stuck in the role of schools and relying on schools to just take them through that. And, you know, I don't know. I don't always know how to make that spark happen again for them. But yeah, that, sorry to go all the way back. That's usually the most unusual, like uh, surprising moments. You know, I just got a question from Hannah. Hannah paraphrased beautifully the um, publisher question. So I think both of you, um, Vera with your blog, which you could talk a little bit about maybe, and uh, Julie as a librarian, and um, how do we push publishers to bring more representation into math stories? And, um, well, it says publishers and early math creators, but I would say, based on what we've been discussing, it's not just representation, it's really own voices, stories, and own voices, illustrators. How do we, you know, the, the questions that had come in were, well, what if those books don't sell as well? What if publishers want to make money um, and they they don't want to try out new authors or or go in this other direction? So how do we push them to, to do what Charles Bridge is doing? Um, I and and. I... The financial model for for how book buying works is a lot different now than it was 50 or 60 years ago uh, when libraries and schools had such a big had a lot of purchasing power. Right. Um, so uh, so it's a lot different now. But I think we we always um, we always vote with our wallets. What are we buying for our collections? What are we putting on display? What are we um, handing to children? What are we reading in story time? What are we talking about? Um, I think that's that's a big that's a big deal. Word of mouth is 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 huge, um, and um, you know the the more you talk about something and the more excited that you get kids and families about something, the um, the more it sort of rises to the top. I think um, so. Being really conscious about um, about what it is that um, you're advocating for in your collection and with your families, I think, is a really important way of of um, of helping um, sort of push those decisions a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and I think too, there's a lack of understanding at least maybe for just educators in the classroom versus librarians who might have a, because of the buying, the, the role they have in actually purchasing books for schools is different than the educator in the classroom who just, you know, usually spends their own money or use different mediums to get books in. And so I think once I understood more of the book buying in and more of the publishers, um, even the process of, of getting a book to become a book, you know, I don't think that a general ed teacher knows that knowledge or has that or has access to that information. And once I knew that it changed how I started having conversations with books and and the the hook that I would use teacher to talk to teachers about why they needed that book and the push I would give to them to give to their schools so that again it would trickle down to the publishers to to produce these more of these books so I think 
I don't know how that happens. I don't know the best medium to get that information out. But I also think the other part is, is showing books. So, you know, I think, especially now in, in COVID and having access to bookstores, people want to see the cover for sure, but they want to know what's inside. And when I show a book with three or four pages of the inside, that's what does the selling because now they get the story, right? And that phrase, you can't judge a book by its cover is true. And so a lot of people are enticed, right? This is enticing, but I don't know what's inside. And if I can't get to a bookstore because of whatever, if I, if I only access to books and knowing what I can provide for my kids is the cover, sometimes that's not good enough. And so really helping educators see the inside, explaining its own voices, you know, tagging the author and the illustrator in the photo or whatever you share. So then they could see them and they can, it's, I think what we've learned from social media, good or bad, is that we can instantly be connected. And once we understand that connection, it either builds or destroys relationships. And so when we can start to build a relationship with someone based on what we see, we can invest more. And if that investment leads to books being published, more books being published that feature own voices or written by own voices, illustrated by own voices, the better off we'll be. So basically long short, saturate with information. <laughs> Whatever the information is, there should be no more secrets. This gatekeeping stuff has to end and everyone should have a clear page and understanding of what they need to do to make things better. That's exactly right. And I would build on that by saying, sometimes when I talk to teachers, they're, they're, it's, they have so much to do to just keep, you know, their their math class running or their history class running. And a, a huge chunk of a librarian's job is knowing what's out there book wise and what's new and what's just been published. And for those two groups to talk to each other regularly um, can help can help um, sort of teachers who are maybe having to resort to using books that they've used forever because they just don't have the time to find, um, to sort of see what's come out this year and last year and what's coming out next year. And um, sort of having those connections and talking about it um, is, is a great way to sort of um, get the educators and, um, and the pool of books more connected. Do you have, have you had any experience with, you know, publishers coming to you um, and saying, you know, what do you think? What books, what books fly off your shelves? What books are parents and kids most excited about? And is there a need to make that connection so that they'll take more seriously the importance of own voices stories? I guess I worry a little bit about that end of things, because I, I feel like there already exist people who are creating stories, creating illustrations. And so the publisher should be talking with them mm -hmm. and, and seeking them out versus, and I mean, I know that this does happen if, you know, I'm an educator and they're like, what books do you want? And then they seek out somebody to write those books. So I know that both of those ways to create books exist. I just feel like um, there are plenty of people out there ready to tell their own organic story. Um, how how do we build a community that continues to uplift, you know, the marginalized? Um, and I don't have an answer other than, you know, we just keep sharing great books and we keep talking about the need for great books and we keep the conversation open and, you know, inviting as many people in as possible. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't. Um, I, I. I don't think in any any formal or very serious way that a publisher has ever asked me what I, what I need. And <laughs> they might casually ask me, sort of, you know, how's it going? What do kids like? But I don't. I don't think that it affects sort of their production. <laughs> um, and I and I think that's fine. Um, I I really agree with Vera that I think that there are um, folks out there who who want to tell their stories and have have stories to tell and um, how do we find, how do we find them and how do we, how do we, how do we make that happen? 
Well, yeah, I mean, as someone who is not not a children's book author and is new to this world as of a few years ago, um, the, there's so many people who want to write books. And because of all kinds of systemic things, those names that, that are out there are often white authors from, you know, more traditional I mean, we see the same thing in math is that um, the people who write children's books aren't necessarily familiar with the fact that spatial relationships or patterns or you know measurement or, you know those that there's lots of experiential kinds of things that are are very important for young children and they their image is that traditional well math is a worksheet or math is numbers um, and so there are so many gatekeepers along the way. The stories that get sent to publishers may be for more traditional. The publishers themselves, well, they didn't go into publishing because I love math. They went into publishing because I love books. And so there's, you know, they're not looking for fresh takes on geometry. They're looking for, you know, oh, a new way to do accounting book. <laughs> so I think it's it's kind of a systemic problem of um, how do we how do we get something new and different out there in terms of diversity and in terms of great math stories. But um, Charles Bridge is trying and again I think that this whole thing is thanks to Heising Simons Foundation because they were willing to put some resources toward rethinking what what can we do and we're not trying to put out what's there or commission a series where, you know, Alyssa and I put out the call for books and we saw what we got. And um, Charles Bridge really went out of their way to connect with author groups of color. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's a wonderful job they did. I think I'm so excited to see what comes next. I feel like every book I read, I'm just like learning something new as of that, like maybe not with the math, but at least with like the cultures and the language. And, you know, I think my one takeaway, at least for teachers is as you're engaging in these books and there might be a concept that is, you're not your strong suit. There might be a language, you know, uh, Le Leah and uh, Luis features some Portuguese words. So you might feel intimidated, just like research, Google, and do it in front of your kids so they can see you're learning along in the process too. Um, and don't feel intimidated to, you know, try something new, take new steps, be wrong. But there's some great, great and exciting stories here. Well, Art's book is gonna have some Cherokee or has some Cherokee in it. And that will be out in the sum this coming summer. Um, and eventually we'll have um, all the words pronounced on the Charles Bridge website. And I see the authors for the next panel are on. So do you have any last comments or should we say goodbye? Hi, Hannah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Vera and Julie for thank all your you. great ideas. <laughs> Thank you. This has been so fun. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to start removing our Bye. panelists from the stream. All right. Okay. That was a wonderful, lively discussion. Thank you again to Marlene, Vera, and Julie. Um, next up, let's talk more about own voices in kids' math stories. Uh, our moderator, Karen Boss, will be leading the discussion today with our authors, and I'm excited to hear more. Okay, let's add Karen to the stream and our authors, and then we'll go from there. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. All right, everyone can hear each other, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. That already means we're winning because that did not work during our tech check. So thank goodness. Um, so I'm so glad you're all here. It's so nice to see you all on the screen. I just wanna do a quick introduction so that folks know a little bit about who you all are. So I'm gonna start with me. Um, I am an editor at Charles Bridge and I grew up in the Boston area and I've lived all over the US and abroad for a little while too. And my dedication to diversity in general spans about 25 years and three careers. 
And I'm so glad that that now involves getting diverse stories into the world. Like how awesome is that to, to, for that to be happening? Originally, okay, I'm gonna start off with Anna. Anna waved to everybody, although they can see your name. Um, originally from Brazil, Anna moved to the US 20 years ago to attend graduate school. And she tells us that her stories are inspired by everyday life and are usually sprinkled with Brazilian characters or culture or with nature themes too. And Anna, you live in Colorado, right? And you um, enjoy hiking in the pine forest, which is, I'm very jealous about. That's all. <laughs> Natasha's next. And um, Natasha, you tell us you were born in Malaysia. You grew up in Singapore and Hong Kong, both. And you now live in a town in Northern California with your family. And you also like to walk in the hills and the woods. And um, you write multicultural stories that are inspired by your Asian upbringing from what you told us. And then Rajani is last but not least. And Laza La sorry, Rajani LaRocco was born in India, raised in Kentucky, and now lives in the Boston area with your wonderful family and your impossibly cute dog. Um, and you like to spend time writing novels and picture books when you're not practicing medicine. So that gives our audience a little bit of information about you all. Um, and so we're gonna talk about own voices in particular today. And we do have some slides to share, but we'll get to that in a little bit. And Hannah is behind the scenes with those slides. So when you are ready for her to put them up for your book, you can just verbally tell her to do that and she will. Um, so what we are gonna do is focus on the one question that each of you has been assigned. And then we have sort of a question for everyone, but let's be sure that you can all jump in whenever you want. If you have something to add just that something else that someone is saying, no one's doing like a full on presentation here. We're really having a conversation that I think will be so interesting to the folks who are watching. So let's start off with Anna. So how do you define own voices in specifically in terms of books for kids? Sure. First of all, hi, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here, Karen. I, it's an honor to participate. Um, so I see own voices as writing about experiences that are intrinsically yours, right? So these are things that you grew up with, that it's, that it's part of you. So uh, when you're sharing them with a larger audience, you're able to put in details that maybe somebody, for instance, in my case, who is, I am Brazilian, so maybe somebody who uh, visited Brazil may have seen it, but have not really experienced it from a uh, uh, a native Brazil, well, I don't want to say native, but like someone who was born in Brazil and grew up in Brazil. So, um, so that's how I see it. Although I, in so a lot of times I think it's applied to race and to culture, but I've also seen it applied to illnesses. So people who have maybe multiple sclerosis or lupus who can talk about it from their own experience, that would be own voices as well, right? So it's really something, in my opinion, that is part of you, part of you. Um, and uh, so when it comes to book, to the book itself, I don't know, we didn't really discuss when uh, to come up with the slides, but I think now might be a good idea, Hannah, if you don't mind bringing up the uh, Lee and Louise slide. So I didn't say that I am the author of Lee and Louise who has more um, one of the books in the series. And uh, I'm going to read to you just three pages in that um, in the book. They're not the first pages, um, but I just wanted to show a few things to you. So if you don't mind moving the slide ahead. So uh, so this, like I said, this is not the first page, but uh, they're in the Brazilian store. And uh, Louise says, Louise starts bragging. I have more and Leah doesn't like it. Can you move this slide? Oops, one back. Okay. Yeah, for once Louise has a point. His bag of tapioca biscuits is bigger than Leah's bag of croquettes. The next one. It's taller, wider, deeper. Louise must have more. And so, as you can see in this one page, not only let's not even talk about the math right now, but talking about the own voices and etc. Um, Giovanna, who illustrated the book, is also Brazilian. 
So the even the colors of the package of Biscoito de Bovilha are very much like what it usually is. Um, it has red on. I actually just ate some because I had a I had another event today. So I just finished a package and look how the red and the yellow. Um, so even these details that uh, people usually will not pay attention to um, make the story authentic because Giovanna is Brazilian and she knows what it looks like, um, right? So, so the, this is what makes own voices so fascinating in my opinion, is because you really can have a look through, uh, you can really have an idea of what another culture is, like look uh, um, through the window, right? How is it that we say exactly? Windows and mirrors, you mean? Windows and mirrors. It's, it is a look through the window, uh, like a, or even a sliding door, it's tapping to a different culture that, uh, and that makes the story so authentic. And Lee and Louise is one page that is not in there, but, um, that is here in the book is uh, when they go downstairs. Hannah, Hannah, you can close the slides out for a minute, probably. Oh yeah, sorry, Hannah. No, no worries. So, like, even in this page right here, if you can see the little snacks uh, in the window, these are all very much Brazilian snacks that Giovanna picked. And these, well, these here. These are her favorite. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, so, so, um, um, so this is what makes own voices uh, so appealing. It's the fact that all these little details that someone else might not notice is very noticeable to the kids who are Brazilian Americans who are reading these stories and seeing themselves in these. Uh, 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 pictures, seeing the Brigadeiro, which is the one that I mentioned, the black one that Giovanna likes, or the Pudim de Leite that is in there too, or even the Coxinha de Galinha and the Piscoito de Povilho, all of those things that they never see in a traditionally American book, uh, uh, they are seen for the first time. And so, and, and it's part of their culture. So that's what it is. And it's extremely important, we all know, and all the panelists talked about it, how important it is. So that's that's great. Thank you, Anna. I do wanna um I do wanna attribute the windows, mirrors, and sliding doors to Dr. Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, who um, came up with that framework. And when we talk about that, we, a lot of us in publishing use that framework all the time to talk about books and whether it's a window or whether it's a mirror. And um and I think that getting into the habit as much as we can as as using Dr. Bishop's name when we talk about it is um is good practice. So not that you didn't, that's totally fine. No. Oh, that's okay. For I didn't know who had yeah, for our participants, I want them to know the attribution for that model. So yeah, that's great. Okay, we're gonna move to uh, I, actually. Let me just ask Rajani and Natasha. Do you have anything you want to add to what Anna said before we move on? Well, one thing I would say is that for someone who is not from that culture, that includes me, I'm so fascinated to learn about fun things, especially food things <laughs> that come from another culture that it's, I mean, it's delightful. So it doesn't, uh, you know, I think that there's of course appeal to people from that culture, to children from that culture to see themselves, but it's, there's also huge appeal to people who are not from that culture to learn something new in a familiar setting, which is two people kind of competing about something, which is so much fun. Yeah, and I do think that's why Dr. Bishop include, included the mirror, I mean, the window along with the mirror, right? Because we, the idea is for both things to happen if, if possible. That's great. Awesome. So we're going to move to Natasha. And Natasha is... I totally agree. Oh, sorry. Okay, awesome. We're going to move to your question, Natasha. So, um, and you can let Hannah know when you're ready for your slides too. So Natasha, um, okay. question is this, why do you think that own voices is particularly important important in the kid lit world? Why is it? Why is having stories written by those who are living the experience that's shown in the book important for kids books? I think Anna touched on a lot of that is that um, it's, it's great to uh, for kids, for one thing, to see themselves in um, the pages of books and also to know that they are not um, alone in their own experiences, that there are um, kids around the world who experience the same 
cultures and traditions and rituals that they may go through in their own families. Um, and it's also great for kids to learn about other cultures through the stories and through um, food is such an important thing, right? What kids uh, do not love snacks and just to kind of draw them in uh, to that culture through food and storytelling and, um, you know, if, if you can bring in food uh, and connect it with festivals and other cultural traditions is such a great way to um, entice kids to read about that culture and to immerse themselves in that culture and, and those traditions. So I think that's so important. Um, you know, so I, and one of the things when I uh, was uh, asked to write this book was my first thought um, in terms of the setting was I wanted to set it in a dim sum restaurant because again, that is such a, um, it's culturally important, um, you know, the, especially in the Cantonese culture because the, because dim sum really developed in Southern China. And uh, it's, it's a big part of our, uh, you know, cultural traditions. Uh, I remember as a child growing up in Hong Kong, every Sunday was dim sum day, we'd go out and have our dim sum lunch on Sundays. Um, and to this day, every time I go and visit my family in the Bay Area, it was like, let's go out to dim sum. And, that, and that's a great treat um, for me, especially living in a small town in Northern California. I don't get uh, to eat dim sum very often. So that's always a big treat. Um, so if you wanna um, put on my slides now, Hannah, I can kind of read um, the pages. My book. So Luna's Yum Yum Dim Sum is my story. And um, it's about three kids. Uh, Luna is the main character who goes out to a dim sum restaurant for her birthday lunch. And um, as they go through uh, the, the lunch and the ordering and all that, you get a sense of the tradition of dim sum and how um, dim sum restaurants are kind of laid out and how food is ordered. Um, but then we incorporate the math in when Luna drops one of the pork buns that she orders. And now they have to figure out how are you going to split five pork buns amongst three kids instead of six pork buns, which divides equally. So on this page, um, they are ordering the some restaurants from um, the carts, which is very traditional. Uh, what would you like, asked Baba? Pork buns, cries Luna. Two baskets, please, says Kai, her big brother. We love pork buns, says little brother Benji. Baba waves to the dim sum server. He orders two baskets of cha siu bao. Next page, please. Three pork buns in each basket, Luna says. Two for me, two for Kai, and two for Luna, cries Benji. Kai takes a pork bun. Benji takes a pork bun. Yum, yum, dim sum, cries Luna. She grabs a pork bun. Next page. Splat. Oh, no. Next page. I think those are the three that you have. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so there you go. She drops the pork bun, and now they have to figure out how are they going to split the pork buns equitably. And in the meantime, you learn about pork buns and you learn about dim sum restaurants. And um, so it's a fun way to bring math and diversity and STEM all together. That's great. So Anna and um, Natasha, um, and actually this applies to Rajani as well. All three of you ended up with um, also what we call an own voices illustrator, right? So uh, Anna, your story was illustrated by a Brazilian um, American or Brazilian woman. Mm -hmm. And Natasha, I actually, I'm not sure what Violet, if, do you and Violet share the same background or are you more of a broader Asian background that you share? Uh, no, she's, I'm um, Chinese and she is uh, Korean. And so she lives, uh, and but she's a Korean living in Taiwan. So ah, like, okay. Quite a right. diverse too. Okay, good. And she's also familiar with dim sum then, right? Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I don't know how because it's not part of the Korean culture generally, but she does live in Taiwan. Um, I, I don't know how big dim sum is in Taiwan. It is Mandarin speaking rather than Cantonese speaking over that's there. That's true. Yep. Um, 
but it, it is interesting because within the China, within Asian cultures, there are differences. So, um, and I, I love working with Alyssa because she's got such a great editorial eye. And in one of the uh, images, I'll um, show you which one, there is a picture in the background um, of, the, of the restaurant and um, the picture shows different kinds of foods that are supposedly served in the restaurants. I don't know if you can see this picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can see it. Oh, right there on the wall. So one, one of those images in the beginning um, was actually an image of um, sushi. And Alyssa pointed out, isn't that Japanese? And I didn't even notice the background. So it was, so, so, so those, um, cultural differences come up too in, you know, uh, an illustrator and a writer who are not of the same culture. And um, but it was an easy fix. You know, we we have deemed some restaurants that are or deemed some um, dishes that are kind of have the same coloring but shaped differently as sushi. So I think she was able to make that um, switch without you know too much difficulty. That's great. I think that's important. A really important note that you just made is about how um, I think the broader the broader publishing world sometimes says, "Okay, we need an oh, oh no, am I frozen?" No, you're no, good. Am I frozen? You're good. You're good. I'm okay. All right. Good. Some of you froze. I thought it was me. Okay. Um, that in the publishing world, we sometimes tend to say, oh, we want an own voices illustrator for this book. And then because so many of us are white people who don't know what we're talking about, we say, oh, well, it's just Asian or it's Native American. And then the differences between cultures and groups within this broader context the white people just can't even conceive of and get out of their own way for it, right? And so sometimes it's really no problem where a Brazilian illustrator, a Brazilian author, that's very clear, it's very specific. But then in Natasha, in your situation, it's very it's very different, right? Because you're saying there's so many differences between a Korean illustrator and a Chinese author. And so I think that's a really important thing to pay attention to when we talk about how own voices illustration works. And then Rajani, in your case, your illustrator for Bracelets for Venus Brothers actually lives in India, whereas the kids in your book maybe live in India, but I think probably they live in they can live in the United States just as easily, right? Yeah. But the but the cultural piece around the holiday in your book, I think um uh, it, it is cultural for Indian folks, no matter where they live. And so that that's a good segue actually into Rajani's question, which is what, is what were some of the challenges you had about fitting culture and math and story all into the same manuscript, which I'm sure you all had that challenge, but Rajani's gonna answer the question. <laughs> so first of all, you know, oh, what I will muted. say, oh, okay. I'm muted. Nope, uh, you're okay, you're okay. Now. Okay, good. Um, so first of all, what I will say is, one of the most interesting things about the way this story came to be is that as a writer and as somebody who has taken a lot of math in their lives, I never really thought about very early math for very young readers. Like I hadn't really thought about that. Even when my kids were little, we kind of just did things and that was it. Um, but your, the workshop that Charles Bridge put on where they invited authors to analyze math books for young children and kind of critique them and kind of talk about like what else could we bring to this really opened my eyes to what constitutes math. And so one of the things, you know, my mind was kind of spinning that day. It was amazing. It was like pop, pop, pop. Um, one of the things that I realized was, oh, patterns are, you know, a form, it's a kind of math. It's early math for little kids. And honestly, it was that day, it was the day of that workshop that I was like, oh, patterns and I linked it to making beaded bracelets or jewelry and then I it jumped to this Indian holiday. Now the book is called Bracelets for Bina's Brothers. Most of the time you wouldn't think about making bracelets for boys but this is you know where the cultural piece comes in where I was like oh yeah there's totally a holiday that is about sisters and brothers and it's about their love. And so sisters give bracelets to their brothers to kind of protect them, kind of like amulets. And then the brothers give gifts to their sister. So that's how this started. 
And um, for me, believe it or not, I don't have any siblings. I don't have any brothers or sisters, <laughs> but I write about siblings a lot. I have a son and a daughter. And um, that's where the story came from, was kind of how brothers and sisters love each other. They also kind of can't stand each other sometimes, but they really do love each other. So um, Hannah, if you wouldn't mind showing the slides. And I mean, and so Chaya Prabhat is the illustrator and she just, I mean, that is an exuberance of color. And that is so Indian to me, those jewel tones. And I also love everybody's like hilarious expressions and this gigantic dog. <laughs> Next, please. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, the, the kind of introduction to the story. So, um, it's one week until Raksha Bandhan, says mommy. Shall we buy bracelets for your brothers? And then here is where the explanation of the holiday is, because obviously not everyone's familiar with the holiday. Raksha Bandhan was a special holiday for sisters and brothers. Every year, Bina gave each brother a bracelet to keep him safe. And Bina's brothers gave her a gift and promised to take care of her. Then they went back to annoying her. I'm big enough to make bracelets now, Bina said. Thara can help me make patterns with beads. And Thara is the dog. Uh, so I just want to, so I, oh, just go back one second. So I just want to talk about a little bit, um, just how many different colors and how, so a lot of the, the patterns that, that Bina works on in the book are every other one patterns and how many examples of every other one patterns there are. You know, I am not an illustrator at all. I am amazed with what an illustrator can bring to a project. So if you look on the kind of right-hand part of the slide, all those bracelets there um, with every other one, um, the alternating kind of like uh, pieces of the rug with every other one. Uh, it is just, it's just absolutely incredible. And then, so one of the things that Chaya just knew, um, if you look at those little portraits in the frames, she knew the clothes that these kids would be wearing, like no problems. And um, th that wasn't something I had to um, explain to her at all. Next slide, please. Real quick, uh, Rajani, I just want to say too, yeah. this is where the partnership with Turk and with Marlene came in and was so important because as we were reviewing illustrations as they came in, and Chaya did a, such an awesome job of putting all that stuff in, but Marlene was the one whose eye and whose math sense could be like, hey, you know what another good place is for alternating patterns? Right here. And then and then John and I would go, oh yeah. And then we'd tell Chaya and she would add it. And so it was really, this is one of the things about doing books about math, right? Is to have the math expert looking at everything is really key too. I just wanted to throw that shout out to Marlene because God, her, the way her brain works is so phenomenal. I, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, and then here comes kind of the beginning of the story problem, right? So Bina found Vijay reading. How about a story, he asked. His funny voices made Bina laugh. I know your favorite color is blue, she said, but are there colors you don't like? I don't like green. Why, Giggles? No reason, said Bina, and don't call me Giggles. So I think that's the end of the slides. Oh no, it's you not. Oh, more. There's one more. Okay, so here she is trying to make some bracelets. Okay, this is what, for one of her other brothers who likes one particular color and doesn't like another. She moved on to Sid's bracelet. She started with his favorite, green. She liked orange, so she used it again. Green, orange, green, orange. Then the music note bead. Then, uh oh, didn't Sid tell us he hates? Orange, said Bina. What should we do, Thara? So more every other one. Um, so to answer, this was a long way to get to your question, but I guess the, <laughs> the, the answer for me is that um, there was a lot to put in. And for me, the cultural context was the easy part. The hard part for me was to make the math um, make sense, make it be a complete story with, uh, you know, a, a story problem that Kind of goes through some phases where you're worried whether you know about whether Bina can actually accomplish what she wants to, and um, having an ending that is satisfying. So it's it was a lot of material to put into a book, and you know as we know in picture books we want to try and minimize the words, but um, some things needed explanation, so we explained them. And you were so much fun to work with; it was really great to go through the process with you. 
thanks for that. Yeah, it was it was really fantastic to edit this book with you, and I can't wait to share it with. I have nieces who are um, who are part of the Indian culture. They don't have brothers though, so they don't really know about this holiday. But they have all these boy cousins, and so who have siblings. So I wonder if it is something that they are aware of. So thank you for all of that. Um, we're going to move on to this sort of everyone question, where I've asked all of you to be. Uh, to answer this this one, um, and and I think some of, I, from what I know, some of you have some good stories about this. So um, the question really is, how did your particular culture come to shape your story and your characters, um, knowing also that you had to get the math in there, right? And um, and knowing like that the whole point of this storytelling math program is to get not only that everyday math into kids' hands, but to get more culture and more um, authors of color and illustrators of color into these young picture books. Um, and how did your own culture and the way you grew up or the way that you still practice cultural things, how did that impact how you shaped it all? So who wants so, to start? I Anna, can start. Okay, okay, good. Um, so when I, I didn't purchase, I've heard of those workshops and they all seem wonderful and I wish I had participated, but I didn't. So, um, when I heard about this story, I actually, uh, met Alyssa during a conference and she told me about the call for submission. And I was a little intimidated because I had never written a book based on a prompt and certainly never written a book that included math in it. Um, so, so what I did, uh, first what I did was actually concentrate on my culture. And so my thought process was I'm going to find a, an area of my culture that I want to focus on and I am going to later come up with a mathematical concept for it. But it happened the other way around. Um, so as I was thinking about like trying to remember things from my childhood and etc., I remember this one question that my parents used to ask me, which is what weighs more, a kilo of cotton or a kilo of lead? And um, and I, I've, I've said it many times that I, I think people probably think it's sort of weird what child knows what lead is but um but in brazil we use lead as a comparison for uh, something that is very heavy so like uh, as children grow up and we're trying to carry and they become harder and harder to carry them uh we'll say oh this child is like a chumbinho and chumbinho means small uh, little lead right so we know that lead is heavy even though we have absolutely no idea of what it is so so and of course both cotton and in lead in this case it's one kilo of each so they weigh the same right and so when i remember that question that became the mathematical hook for the book and then i had to figure out how to include the the culture so it was the opposite of what i thought it would be um, and, and so coming up with a, a food to represent the culture, that was the easy part because then all I had to do was to come up with something to represent the cotton. And I wish I hadn't eaten the entire bag of biscotti de polvi because I could show it to you. But uh, it's very well shown in the book. Um, but uh, biscotti de polvi is very light and small and even white like cotton. So that was easy. The coxinha de galinha is a little harder to come up with, um, but eventually I did. And again, I have to say uh, Marlene was wonderful. And there were so many little things that we did to make sure that we were incorporating the math correctly. I mean, I even went to the store to buy biscuits de polvilho and coxinha de galinha and weighed everything, measured them, took pictures, sent it to Marlene and Alyssa. They came up with a uh, with a, a chart almost like a, to compare it, like the size of the coxinha, the size of the child, the size of the biscoito. It was incredible, but that's how. And there is also in my book, there is a little bit of language as well. Um, and my, my Lee and Louise are Brazilian Americans and I based it on my kids. What are the expressions in Portuguese that they, even though English is their first language because they were born here um, and grew up with English at school and etc., they still spoke Portuguese at home. And what are the Portuguese expressions that uh, stayed with them? And some of these Portuguese expressions are represented in the book. 
so. And I just wanted to address something really quick because somebody in the previous uh, uh, um, panel mentioned uh, like sometimes people are intimidated by language in the in the book, like by a different language. So I wanted to mention really quick that uh, the book does include, first of all, an incredible glossary with um, the pronunciation of the words. I never know which way to go. Uh, with the pronunciation of the words. And um, aside from that, um, we also were very careful to write the Portuguese words only in the speech bubbles. So that if the adults, for any reason, feel intimidated by foreign words in the book, they can very well skip those speech bubbles. The story still makes sense. So just wanted to put it out there. But sorry, I took too long. Yeah, no, you didn't. That was great. And that's a that was an ingenious decision that you and Alyssa made. I wish it weren't a thing that had to be done, right? Because mm -hmm. um, but I know it's true. I mean, I, I have edited books that have integrated language in them where I've then gifted them to friends who've said, I'm afraid to read this book to the kids because I don't want to mess up the words. And I'm like, but your kid doesn't know any different, first of all, if you were to mispronounce it. And the pronunciation's right there, like read it a couple times and you'll learn it. But it, it, I get where people do get afraid that they're going to do something wrong so they choose to not do it at all and i i hope we can somehow start to shift the culture on that in terms of people reading outside picture books outside of um their own experience with you know words that might be a challenge okay natasha and rajani which one of you guys wants to go next one of you women i shouldn't say guys <laughs> i i can go um so i i have to um echo what um Anna is saying that i really appreciated the help I got from Marlene and from Alyssa while writing this story. First of all, I grew up in um, in a society where math was taught in a very rote kind of a way. Uh, you know, a lot of, um, so math to me was worksheets and um, memorization. And so I've always grown up feeling very intimidated by math. And I was really intrigued by this project. And first of all, I thought, oh God, can I write a math book? And then I started looking at some of the examples and I thought, oh, okay, you know, this is for preschool and kindergarten, I can write a math book. And then I started um, working with Alyssa and, and um, Marlene on the math concept because my first uh, attempt at writing this story, I had immediately thought of the dim sum setting and that's what I wanted to set it in. Um, and such a great setting for you know just you know different cultural foods and I mean the the, the food some of which you know if you haven't eaten dim sum before um, you know can be unique and fascinating and all that and there's like all kinds of different shapes and colors to dim sum and I thought this would be uh, you know a great subject for a, a book about math and then also when you order and you eat up the food there's like addition and subtraction and you know that kind of stuff and then so my first draft was uh turned down by Alyssa, who said well we're not really looking for a straight counting and shapes book so then i um had a conversation with marlene and we kind of talked around some different math ideas and then the idea came up about you know because i um i guess you know sharing and friendship is is a, has been a theme in my uh, previous books. Um, so I like the idea of them kind of coming together and deciding, you know, how are you going to share these dim sum um, dishes equitably um, among the five, uh, among the three siblings. And so we had a discussion about whether it was better math, uh, math wise to share um, five dumplings with three kids or three dumplings with five kids. So which way should the math go? And then Alyssa and I had a uh, interesting discussion about, well, you know, do we want to use a dim sum item that was um, pretty familiar with for American audiences like pork buns, which is, you know, or something that's a little bit less familiar like uh, egg custard tarts to introduce kids to you know, something that's different. So um, we kind of had that conversation and we decided on something that was a little bit more familiar um, to the American audience. Um, 
And then so, you know, and then how how do we divide it up equitably? So um, I think that was a, an eye opener for me in terms of just um, my discussion with Marlene on what is better and what works better the, the math wise. And then also in in terms of uh, Alyssa's um, uh, suggestion on let's go with something that's a little bit more popular and more familiar to the American audience because we're we're trying to incorporate the math piece so you know let's simplify that other part of it um, and um, so that's you know that's how we kind of came up with the story. That's great. That's how about great. you, Rajmani? So um, as I mentioned earlier, the the idea for this story came like I knew it was going to be about patterns. And I knew it was about this holiday, Raksha Bandhan. And I love this holiday in particular because it's not as well known as some of the other Indian holidays that people might know, you know, Diwali and Holi and all those things. So um, so it's lesser known, but I love that it is really about um, the bond between siblings. So, you know, in the greater cultural context in India, you know, traditionally when girls got married, they went and lived with their husband's families. Like they didn't live in their house anymore. Like they didn't necessarily have a lot of connection back to their own families. And of course things have changed a great deal, but this is kind of from those days where it's like brothers and sisters say, we have this bond forever, no matter who you marry or where you go, we're, we're still connected. And I just love that idea. And then, um, you know, in terms of kind of the universality of the story, it's about, siblings and how they can drive you crazy and how you still love them and how and this little girl really puts a lot of effort into making these bracelets very specifically for each of her brothers like taking into in, into account what they like what they don't like like a special interest that they have and she really tries to get it right and um i just i love that aspect of it where she's just working really really hard and in the end um you know, it pays off because they're happy and then they give her something and she's happy too. And I have to say, as food obsessed as I am, there's not that much food in the story, sadly, but there's like one cookie. But because Chaya like knows how to illustrate any Indian holiday, which of course involves sweets, I just have to show you here from the proof. There is, there are sweets everywhere oh my goodness those burpees and those ladoos like i could eat them right now so <laughs> amazing so even though i didn't write that part into the story chaya put it there and that like makes me super happy so yeah i i think that um the you know the cultural context is a first is a fun jumping off point because um it's uh it, it's it sets up this kind of unusual situation in which a girl is making bracelets for her brothers, but then the rest of it uh, could happen in anybody's family where somebody is trying to make something special for somebody else. That's great. So um, folks who are watching us right now, if you wanna type any question you have for this panel into the chat, then we can try to address those. Um, but I also wanted to just say that, um, what I love about the storytelling math series overall and all three of your stories is um, what something close, what you just said, Rajani, is that there's this universality about the stories where, um, you know, yes, they're about all of them about are about siblings, right, in different ways. But also we've got one where it's like the brother's kind of trying to, you know, always kind of push his sister with Luis, who's a little bit on the like, He's a little rude sometimes, Luis is, right? Um, and then we have um, Luna, who keeps claiming it's her birthday, so she should get more than everybody else, which is so universal, right? And then we've got Bina, who has these brothers who tease her, but who also is just bound and determined to do this project herself, right? She doesn't want help from mom. And I feel like in that story, it's really clear, like this is the first time she's asserted that. Like this is really like, I am gonna do this myself. All of those things are such, so universal. They're just like every kid in the world in this age group is navigating that, right? Um, and for me, that's one of the beautiful things about this is that I get to encounter math and I get to encounter um, these cultures and then also the illustrations that are so culturally correct and relevant. But then I also just get these stories that any kid in the world is gonna understand, right? Do any of you have anything you wanna add on top of that at all? I think you said everything. I, I noted for the first time that all our stories are about uh, 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 siblings. And uh, yes, they, each one of them show a completely different culture. 
Um, so that is really cool. And yes, like you said, it makes it universal. It shows, it proves that it's universal. So uh, that was fun to notice. I hadn't noticed that before. That's great. One other thing. Whoop. One other thing I'll say is as a kind of um, thank you again to Marlene is that the math is simple, but writing it is not that simple. <laughs> <laughs> to write it in a way that is makes sense and and helps kids is a challenge. So she's amazing. <laughs> yeah, and Rajana, you and I in particular really had to try to cut back on your manuscript, right? Because there was so much complication with the color of the beads and what order they were in and when she was messing up and how she was going to fix it, that it became this like very long manuscript that just wasn't going to work in a picture book. And that was a huge challenge too, is how to cut back, right? Um, I do want to point out that if people haven't seen it, that Alyssa did address in the comments that, that Charles Bridge is going to post videos of all the authors of Storytelling Math pronouncing the non-English word that are in their books. Um, so then readers that can hopefully um, encourage readers to try those words out too. All right, well, we've got only a couple more minutes left and um, maybe three or five more minutes. Um, and I don't see any questions in the, um, in the questions for us, but if Hannah knows of any question that has come up anywhere along the line, um, that would be great if Hannah could let us know that. And then um, I guess what I'll close off with is um, there's this, obviously there's this call for our own voices books, right? And it's happening across the board. I think it was happening before this summer, but I think this summer and after the murder of George Floyd, things ramped up even more in publishing, which I think is a good thing, although I'm so sorry for how that has to come to be. Um, and I wonder though, as BIPOC authors and illustrators, as I talk to more and more folks, there's, there's some pressure there, right? Like that somehow you're supposed to only write stories that are somehow own voices and about your culture. How do you all feel about sort of everything that swirls around there? Well, you know, I, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just gonna say, I, I understand where it comes from. And I think there are certain stories that if you don't have the lived experience, it's very, very, challenging to write authentically. But I also worry that um, that things get taken a little bit too far in, in um, curtailing um, writers' freedom to explore and to uh, research. I mean, part of being a writer is that you're just curious. You're curious about the world. You're curious about different cultures. Um, you do like when I when I travel and I've traveled a lot in my life. I've been very fortunate um, to have grown up in a family who loves to travel, and um, and part of the joy of traveling is to experience new cultures, is to experience um, you know listen to different stories and folklore, and and to you know and as a writer to be able to bring that maybe to um, to my own audience uh, and my own readers. And so I, I think there is a certain intimidation right now for writers to try and explore cultures beyond their own because um, of you know this whole hashtag own voices thing. So um, I'm just worried that it will um, go a little bit too far on the other end. Yeah. And Rajani and Anna, what were you gonna say? So, so, so what I would say is that um, I mean, I love writing about things from, um, you know, including my own culture. Um, not everything that I write has to do with it. And I think that should be okay. And the other thing is that I am not the spokesperson for all Indian people. As I mean, like that can be a little bit scary because I'm, yeah. you know, I have a very specific experience and that's kind of what I bring to the table. So I want to make sure that people know I'm not speaking for everybody. This is just the, you know, this is the story that I can write. And especially from a place as varied as India. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy to think that any one person could. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think the really interesting thing about all of this is that, you know, as I'm getting more books published and have worked with editors more, is that, you know, having somebody with lived experience, at least some aspect of lived experience, people who have not lived it don't even know what they don't know. So it's hard to ask the right questions when you don't understand that you're missing something. And mm -hmm. these happen in really, really small, you know, like in very tiny details, but they can have a big impact 
on um, on whether a story feels true or not. Yeah, that uh, really resonates with me when I first came to the United States to uh, be a student. Uh, during international orientation, like all the questions that I could have asked, but I, I didn't even know how to ask because, I mean, they didn't even come to mind because the possibility that something could be done so differently from what it is, the, the way it's done in my country, just I couldn't even come up with, I don't know, it was just like, and so it takes some adjustment for you to really know which questions to ask. And I very much agree with uh, Hajani. It's the same thing with uh, Brazilians. I am certainly not the spokesperson for Brazilians. And even in this book, when we did the pronunciation guide, for example, I thought that my accent was much harder to pronounce for someone who is not a Portuguese speaker. Um, so I went with a, an accent from a different place that is not the place that I am from. And so I had to make sure that in Sao Paulo, they still call Biscoito de Povilho, Biscoito de Povilho. I had to tag some people to make sure that the name was the same because maybe the name was something else. Um, and so, so there are like all these little details that uh, people don't think about but that if, if it's authentically written, some, someone who is on voices, truly on voices can you know, address those issues. Yeah, for sure. So someone in the chat asked if you all wrote your stories before you had an illustrator or if it was written in coordination with the illustrator. And I know all of you wrote yours without knowing who would be the illustrator for the book, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I know that at Charles Bridge, we always work closely with authors in, in, in sharing who we're thinking about might illustrate your book and asking you how you feel about that. Um, and I know that in our case, Rajani, um, we had a conversation at what would happen if it wasn't an Indian illustrator, right? And whether or not that was even an option. And so um, sometimes that's, an, that's a conversation that needs to happen. Um, for these, for different books around wanting them to be double owned voices or whether they have to be if you are bringing that, that cultural awareness to the table, right? Um, so that was me sort of answering that question for the person. Um, and we also are, we're, we're a little, we're getting, we have like two minutes left. So I wanna just give you a minute to say any last closing thing you wanna say about storytelling math, about your experience with working on them, about anything. So why don't you each take like 30 seconds? Do you have anything you wanna close with? Yeah, so just once again, thank you so much. I am Anna Crespo, the author of Lee and Louise, and you can go to my website, annacrespobooks.com to get, uh, and to charlesbridge.com to get uh, activities for all the books in the story math, storytelling math theory, sorry. Okay, no yeah, that's all. That's thank great. You. I just want to say thank you to Charles Bridge and Alyssa and um, Marlene and everybody who's helped me work on this book. It's I this has been such a great pleasure to work with um, everybody, and I'm so happy to finally get to hold the book in my hand. I think the illustrations are just beautiful, um, and I love the colors. And um, if you want to find out more about me, it's natashayim.com. And I will echo that. I had a ball working on this story with you, Karen, and with Marlene, and everybody at Charles Ridge. And it has been just a joy. And um, I can't even believe how gorgeous it is. So I have, you know, proofs here. So here we go. Um, bracelets for Fina's brothers. And people can find me at my website, RajaniLaraka.com. And I'm just, but I'm so excited about this book. And um, I kind of like want posters and t-shirts made out of it because it's so pretty. <laughs> There you go. Well, thank you all three of you for joining us this afternoon and for talking about this topic and um, about your books. It was just awesome to spend time with all of you. And I'm so appreciative of how great the conversation was. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to remove you from the stream, but thanks for hanging out. Bye. <laughs>
Uh, next up, we're going to be chatting a little bit with Alyssa, our executive editor, um, as well as Dr. Kim Brenneman, and just kind of closing out with final remarks. Alyssa is going to uh, stick around to just tell us more about what's happening in storytelling math for the future. We'll be sharing a little presentation as well. So hang out for a second. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pass it over to Alyssa. Hi again, everyone, and thank you for hanging out with us this afternoon. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I loved attending the panels and um, hearing what all the authors and the educators had to say. So um, now I'm going to just kind of give you an overview of the upcoming books. Uh, right, We have 12 storytelling math books coming out, four board books and eight picture books. Um, and these are the six books that are available right now. So in Graceland's board books, Olivia, May, and Manny play together all year, gardening in spring, blowing bubbles in summer, visiting the farmer's market in the fall, and sharing marshmallows and cocoa in the winter. And as they play, they explore measurement, geometry, spatial sense, and sharing equally in a fun and age-appropriate way. In Leah and Luis, Who Has More by Anna Crespo and Giovanna Medeiros, twins Leah and Luis love Brazilian snacks, but when Luis starts bragging that he has more treats, the two begin to argue. Luis's bag of snacks is bigger than Leah's, and 100 biscuits is way more than two croquettes. But one biscuit is much lighter than a croquette. How can they tell who has more? In The Animals Would Not Sleep by Sarah Levine and Marta Alvarez Miguens, it's bedtime for Marco and his stuffed animals, but the animals have other ideas. When Marco tries to put them away, they fly, swim, and slither right out of their bins. Marco tries sorting the animals by color, size, and behavior, but nothing works, and the animals start getting cranky. How can Marco make everyone happy? Next slide, please, Hannah. Coming in December, just in time for Chinese New Year, is Luna's Yum Yum Dim Sum by Natasha Yim and Violet Kim. When the family goes out for dim sum, Luna and her two brothers have six fluffy pork buns to share. But then, splat, Luna drops one. As the three children try to, try to figure out how to share five buns, they grapple with real world fraction and division, fractions and division. Next up, we have Bracelets for Bina's Brothers by Rajni Laraka and Chaya Prabhat. Bina wants to make her brother's gifts for the Raksha Bandhan holiday. She decides to use her brother's favorite colors to make them beaded, beaded bracelets with patterns, but it's harder than she thought. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. Usha and the Big Digger by Amitha Jagannath Knight and Sandhya Prabhat grapples with rotational symmetry. When sisters Usha and Artie look at the stars, they see different things. U um, Artie sees the Big Dipper, and Usha sees the Big Digger. And cousin Gloria sees the Big Kite. What is going on? Uh, look Grandma, Ni Elisi by Art Coulson and Madeline Goodnight explores volume and capacity. Bo wants to find the perfect container to show off his traditional Cherokee marbles. It needs to be just the right size, big enough to fit all the marbles, but not too big to fit in his family's booth at the Cherokee National Holiday. And his grandma expects him to do it all by himself. In Too Small Tyson by Janae Brown Wood, Tyson wants nothing more than to keep up with his four older, bigger brothers. His brothers, however, call Tyson, Lil Man, and they never let him help out. But when their pet gerbil goes missing, Tyson has little, too small Tyson has big ideas about how to use his size and smarts to save the day. In Again, Essie by Jenny Lassica and Teresa Martinez, Rafael needs to protect his toys from his little sister Essie. So he decides to build a wall tall enough and wide enough to keep her out. He gathers materials from all around the house and starts building. But will the wall be strong enough? And what does Essie really want? So all of these titles are coming out in hardcover and paperback, and eventually in Spanish and English bilingual editions. And that's the storytelling math series, and we're hoping to expand it with more titles. Thanks so much, Alyssa. So next up, we have Dr. Kim Brenneman with some final words. I'll pass it over. 
Thanks so much. Um, I just need to um, express my deep gratitude to everyone who spent this afternoon with us um, coming along on the storytelling math journey. Um, the, my deep gratitude to all of our panelists, our authors and illustrators, um, the authors for sharing their amazing stories with us. And um, also, of course, the teams from Charles Bridge and from Turk. It's been such a joy to work with Marlene and Alyssa, especially um, on the Storytelling Math series. I found myself thinking today, um, you know, when Marlene was describing the beginnings of this whole journey, um, I thought a lot about just this little spark of an idea, the spark of something possible. And I am just so humbled um, at what it's become, these 12 amazing books. Um, we really just started with an idea, um, my colleague Holly and me, and, and Holly had the brilliant insight that Marlene was the person um, that we wanted to be um, bringing together and, and shaping storytelling math. And she then made the connection to Charles Bridge. And it's just been, um, that little spark became something I don't think any of us could have imagined. I also saw today when I was when I was listening to each of the authors describing how they came to their stories and the origins of them. Again, this sort of spark of something possible where some authors described how hard it was to get to that place where they had the right story. Um, but I think we can all agree, anyone who's see, seen any of the books or just saw the beautiful illustrations today, got to hear the authors read a few pages, um, what came out of those sparks is truly incredible. Um, and then of course, there's the spark of something possible for every child who is fortunate enough to have one of these books in their hands, um, with their families, with their teachers. These children will see characters who look like them. They'll see photos of authors and illustrators who look like them too. And there'll be for those children, we hope, this spark a possibility that they too can write beautiful words, they can be authors, they can draw beautiful illustrations, they can be illustrators, and they can be amazing and powerful math thinkers. They already are. So thank you all so much for joining us. This has been such a, just such a joyful journey for me and I think for everyone else. I'm gonna speak for everyone else um, uh, who's been part of this with us. And we're so glad that you joined us here today. All right, thank you so much, Kim. And thanks to everyone again for joining us. We'll be signing off, but we'll see you again soon. Bye.